Okay, so let's get started, everyone. So welcome. It's exciting to uh, have our first in-person meeting after like COVID last year. Um, so today we're gonna just quick agenda about the day. We are gonna first have some uh, introductory words from the deans uh, from the uh, climate school and engineering by Dean Garwood. Uh, and then we'll, I'll present some progress up to date, not just on the research side, but covering also knowledge transfer and education as well. So you actually know what LEAP has been up to for the last couple of months. Uh, then we'll have some quick talks, you know, especially level one to get started. So people will introduce their research and then we'll have the coffee break following by the knowledge transfer presentation. And then we'll go for lunch. And then we'll have the level two and level three. So we'll talk about those different levels, but some other presentations about research. And then finally, towards the end of the day, we'll have the focus groups. And please don't miss the LEAP and GEO training session towards the end of the day. So that will be a hands-on session. So we'll talk a little bit about that later, okay? So to get started, so we have, uh, so thanks for online. We have uh, Moremo who's actually joining us. She's actually co-founding Dean of the Columbia Climate School. She's the younger Valsetzland uh, professor of earth and climate science uh, at the Department of Earth and Environmental Science. She's also the director of Lamont Doherty. She's been working actually on things very close to LEAP, you know, uh, paleo uh, oceanography, marine ge uh, geologies by training. And she's been looking at climate change, especially in the past and the causes of the change. And then that will be followed by Gawud Iyengar. He's actually the senior vice dean in the in CIS, as we call it, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. He's the tank family professor of IUR, industrial engineering and operational research. And his research focuses on things also very connected to LEAP, mathematical models and machine learning applied to a very large uh, suite of problems. So welcome and thanks for being online. I'm just gonna make you full screen. Thank you, Pierre. Shall I start? One second, sorry, I'm trying to. Are you, you trying to make me larger than life? Yes, hey. exactly. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Pierre. Um, and I'm so happy to say a few words of welcome. Um, LEAP is such an extraordinary group of scholars and scientists. For Lamont, for the Climate School, for Columbia, and most importantly, for society at large. The work you are doing is so important to helping us chart a more sustainable future. So Lamont, Gifts, and Columbia have a long history of making groundbreaking contributions to climate science and prediction. And possibly even more importantly, Lamont and CU have pioneered a strategy and a commitment to getting that information into the hands of stakeholders that can use it. Uh, the seasonal predictions of El Nino and IRI's work with global meteorological insurance and agricultural organizations is probably the most obvious example. And now LEAP is driving another great leap forward. Through the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence, you are driving and charting another revolution in our ability to predict and adapt to climate change. So for the early career researchers in the audience and online, I am thrilled for the excitement you are undoubtedly experiencing in this community. It's not often that you could be in on the ground floor of something that's as exciting as this in science. So. I'm thrilled for you all and best of luck for a successful, inspiring meeting. And uh, with that, I will pass it to Garud. Thanks, Remo. Um, thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Galen, for inviting me to speak at the NEEPS year two annual meeting. Welcome to all of you. Um, as Pierre said, I'm Garud Iyengar. I'm the Senior Vice Dean of Research and Academic Programs at the Columbia Engineering School. And I'm also a professor in the Department of Industrial Engineering and Operations Research. On behalf of the Engineering School, I would like to thank all of you for being here, and especially all our researchers and presenters who will be sharing their projects, leading important training sessions, and facilitating the meeting. I would also like to recognize the organizers for their work in making this event possible. Everyone at the Engineering School has been very excited about LEAP since its launch. Indeed, since it was just an idea that Pierre and Gallen were trying to put together, and the journey has been fantastic to see. 
And now LEAP has firmly established itself as a cross-institutional, cross-school center. It's very exciting to see our partners from NYU, UC Irvine, University of Minnesota, Teachers College, NCAR, NASA GIS, all joining us here today. LEAP is really demonstrating the critical role and importance of impact-driven transdisciplinary research and developing collaborations across the Columbia campus and indeed across schools. It's really exciting that in the last 15 months, LEAP is making progress towards its critically important mission of revolutionizing climate projections for informed climate adaptation. And I won't go through all the things that Mo talked about, about all the wonderful things that we have already been doing at Columbia and how LEAP is going to take it to the next level. But I'll focus on what's been happening on the center side. You've all made tremendous progress and we're interested in witnessing new research at the forefront of climate and data science. But at the same time, these, the establishment of the center infrastructure and culture, the RFP model, the research kickoff, the initiati initiating the LEAP Fangio cloud-based data infrastructure for developing key programs, knowledge transfer mechanisms, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. It's been fantastic to see how the center has really put all the mechanisms in place to drive success in the future. And now we're seeing a strong start to year two, diving into research, growing leaps, team of students, postdocs, researchers, launching a, a series in lectures in climate data science, integrating LEAP and Panjo into education, outreach, knowledge transfer activities, and forming key partnerships with community partners and more. I'm really excited to see what's gonna come in year two. Uh, again, I congratulate on you, you on these achievements. I look forward to continuing to follow LEAP's progress as a fantastic new center in climate science. Enjoy your meeting and thank you very much. Um, so what I wanted to present today is first giving you a sense of what we've been up to in terms of the research. So a lot of the research is actually starting. So we are, we are seeing actually the first cohort of LEAP here, uh, PhD students, uh, uh, postdocs and associate research scientists in particular, and a lot of PIs as well. Uh, but LEAP is actually more than research. You know, we have a big educational program. We also have a lot of knowledge transfer. So I'll try to mention some of that and where we are right now. And we are actually reaching really some exciting stages. You know, we'll talk about carbon plan in particular. I don't know where the carbon plan is. The team is yeah, in the back there. Thanks for coming. Uh, you will see some really exciting development about the cloud infrastructure that, you have, that we have for the research, the education, but also for the knowledge transfer. Really, really exciting work. Uh, and we'll talk about progress to date in those different activities. And then we'll talk about what we want to achieve in this meeting, you know, like trying to create a sense of a community and really, I mean, again, it's the first court and we really want to create a legacy. Yeah. So like making sure that we are actually one team. And the key word here is going to be convergence, you know, like across disciplines. So that's really what we want to achieve. So just some background, I think most of you are familiar with that, but just to, to make sure we are on the same page. So really what we're trying to target here with LEAP is climate adaptation as opposed to mitigation. Mitigation is basically reducing emissions to the atmosphere. Here we're basically assuming the climate is changing and we want to adapt to that. You know? And basically we've been witnessing major flooding events, wildfires, uh, you name it. And Basically, what we need to do is to adapt. We actually need to have accurate what we call projections. We need to actually know what the future is going to look, look, look like in a couple of decades. And really, the kind of the timeline we have in mind for, for LEAP is about 2050 to 2060. Why? Because after that, most of the uncertainties come from basically scenarios of, of emissions, right? We don't know how humans are going to, to behave in the future. We don't know if there's going to be any breakthroughs in, in terms of the emissions or uh, ways to actually remove uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and reducing methane. So really that's our primary target. Here. And why do we want to target that? And that's just one example here, uh, looking at global air temperature here across different climate models. So to do a projection, what we do is we actually use a climate model and we actually use not just a single one, but we use multiple climate models. And we typically start looking at the spread across those different models from different groups. You know, one in the UK, for instance, another one in France, and several in the US. And the spread is basically the shading that you're seeing here for global temperature, which is giving you a sense of the uncertainties that we have in terms of the projection, again, here for global temp air temperature. So why do we care about global air temperature? 
it's not really something that affects us, but it, that's something that's being used for policy making. You know, if you've heard about the Paris Agreement, that's what they use for target 1.5 or two degrees of warming compared to pre-industrial is based on this global air temperature, right? And really the trouble is that those uncertainties, I mean, you can see it's actually huge in terms of the range. We are talking about several degree, degrees Celsius, you know, in terms of the uncertainties. And we believe that this does not translate into actionable adaptation, right? Because you have to actually know what the future will look like so that you can actually plan. Think of your, you know, if you have any uh, a retirement plan, that would be exactly the same. You need to know what's going to be coming forward into the future. And really the hope with LEAP is to actually try and narrow down some of those uncertainties, maybe not all of them, but at least uh, a couple of them. And I want to mention here that this is just for global air temperature, but if you were to look at things that are more granular, such as droughts or wetting across different regions of the globe, we can barely actually define the future. In fact, in most of the regions of the globe, we don't know whether we will see more or fewer droughts moving forward, except in the Mediterranean and the Western uh, United States, right? So we are pretty much in the dark there in terms of planning, you know, you can think about water resource management or policy or infrastructure planning. We are already having a hard time here to actually uh, look at the future. And I want to mention here, uh, uh, kudos to uh, actually the carbon plan team and to Julius here. This is going to be, uh, we are going to do basically the same using the Pantheon infrastructure. You know, it, you will see it's so straightforward to actually get that plot here. So um, I should uh, put like made with love with Pangeo, you know, maybe that should be the, the next title that we should have, you know, and you will see it's actually straightforward to, to get that. It used to be extremely complicated to actually just get that. It would take a couple of days to actually get that curve. Now it will take a few minutes. You will see it's, uh, it's amazing what we can do. And so why do we have those uncertainties? In fact, those uncertainties come from typically physical processes that are too small to be represented. Uh, one example of which is going to be clouds here on the left hand side, which is actually, and they tend to be much smaller than the typical grid size that we have in climate models, which tend to be roughly on the order of hundreds of kilometers. We're trying to push down in scale, but roughly we have a hard time actually representing them. And you can see kind of the diversity that we have here for clouds. Same goes for ocean eddies, uh, very difficult to represent, very important for ocean heat storage or photosynthesis, if you're interested in the geochemical cycle and the carbon cycle, it's actually very difficult to know what photosynthesis and how it works at the landscape scale, right? We have, oh, oh, making a mess, right? uh, we have some understanding at the leaf level, but we have a really hard time understanding how that's going to work. And at the tree level and think about the ecosystem, it's actually very, very challenging. Okay, so uh, last year, what we did, and we are going to talk a little bit about that, we defined our strategic plan, you know, so that's actually, that was very useful to define our key objectives for the center. And we also defined our vision and our mission statement. And the vision statement was to uh, basically define a new discipline, which is climate data science to revolutionize climate projections. You know, that's kind of the end goal. You would think about that 10 years from now, that's really the vision we want to achieve. We might not reach that, but that's really our, our primary goal. And our mission was to provide a leap forward in the reliability, utility, and reach of climate projections through synergistic innovations in data science and climate science. And what we mean by that is that we mean that we want to increase the reliability. So again, those uncertainties that I mentioned before, we want to actually reduce them using data-driven method and informed by observations and also high fidelity simulations. So we really wanna reduce those uncertainties. We want to increase the utility of climate uh, data. And we are gonna talk about that again with carbon plants. So how can we actually provide data to a broad range of stakeholders on the public and private side through a platform that's actually very efficient. Uh, and so we will actually launch this platform and that's going to be forthcoming late uh, April potentially. So we are going to talk a, a little bit about that later. And so, and we see that really as being something bi-directional, right? Not just providing data, but also hearing from the community, what do they need, you know, in terms of climate metrics, you know, and those are things that we hope will actually eventually inform uh, climate model development. We want to also to increase the reach uh, of uh, climate data by also strengthening the pipeline in terms of training more diverse climate data scientists and providing, providing climate data to much broader community. And you will see the cloud infrastructure that we have, we provide that in a very, very easy format, you know, for, and you could actually use that directly on your laptop anyway. 
And we believe that the novelty here is really to leverage uh, data science across the entire pipeline, you know, from the pre-processing all the way to the post-processing and how we actually do physical process representation right directly into the model. And that's kind of the ultimate goal. And it's not just about resolution, but trying to be as realistic as possible. We could keep the same resolution, but that's kind of the, the ultimate goal for a climate model so that it looks more real based on some metrics. And we will need to talk about those metrics during the meeting. So just to give you a quick sense again, to show that the center is not just about research. So we have a big research component here. On the left-hand side, so we define this new discipline, which is also based on education, which is what we call climate data science, which is really trying to converge climate science and data science across climate disciplines, you know, atmosphere, land, cryosphere, and ocean, and connecting that basically with the data scientists in the room to make sure that people are well-versed in both languages as well. And we hope that by doing so, we will have a next generation and you're actually the next cohort or the first cohort, actually a next generation of scientists that we hope will be able to actually provide next generation of climate models and next generation of projections. Really, that's our ultimate goal. And through that, we hope that through the bidirectional platform that we will have, we'll have also be able to provide much more accurate and more detailed information to both range of stakeholders, you know, so making sure that the research is actually connected directly to the impact and the knowledge transfer. We'll do that as well through broadening participation. Climate change is affecting everyone and everyone will need to be participating. Otherwise, we'll be failing as a, as a community, of course. And through this modern data infrastructure, so we'll talk at length about Leap and Geo. How did that can actually be used, cloud infrastructure to use that for the, for the research, the education program, but also for the knowledge transfer. And the advantage being that we will use the exact same data across, right? So you could replicate the data. Uh, so welcome for the welcome to the skeptics in the room. And in terms of that data infrastructure, so I wanted just to put it here. So what we are trying to do, so that's actually being led by Ryan and, uh, and Julius here with, uh, with a lot of support from 2 i 2 c and Carbon Plan. And what we are trying to do here is trying to go away from the Donald model, right? Because we are dealing with terabytes or petabytes of data, and there's no way we can actually use that on our laptop, right? So we are trying to actually provide all of the data on the cloud and then do the compute on the cloud. And again, during the Leap and Geo session later today, you'll actually see how we can do that and how in the end it's going to be straightforward to actually plot global air temperature, which sounds like a, an easy thing to do, but which is actually relatively complex to do when you have so many, so many data points and so many data sets. And that's really how we see that, that this cloud infrastructure is gonna be much more inclusive, right? We are gonna provide that to a much broader range of stakeholders from again, research, education, but also public and private uh, stakeholders as well. So first we wanted to present uh, LEAP's uh, staff team. So we have uh, Julius here, so if you can say hi. So he's actually our manager of data and computing, uh, officially hired a few months ago. So really exciting to have him on the team and he's really in charge of uh, a lot of the Leap and Geo infrastructure, how we are actually going to ingest data, the data catalog. So you'll hear about those things a little bit later in the day, but really exciting to have that. That's gonna be a really leveraging a lot of the data that we have and really advancing the research really, really quickly. We had a bootcamp uh, 10 days ago and in two days we were able to actually do a lot of things on climate data and then use that for machine learning just in two days. So. Basically, the barrier to actually start using climate data and using ML is actually reduced dramatically by this type of infrastructure you see that, and I hope you have, you'll appreciate it. Uh, we have Catherine Shah, manager of communication and knowledge transfer, and you've been potentially in touch with her. Thanks for organizing all of that, and we'll be in touch. Wen Chung is actually, uh, it's his first day today. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> And so Wayne is gonna be our, what we call integration engineer, is gonna be helping putting the machine learning onto the uh, community or system model. It's a pretty uh, large endeavor. You know, it's not simple because uh, typically the climate models are, based, are, are, are written in Fortran. The machine learning codes are typically based on Python codes, you know, so it's quite a bit of work to actually interface that. So make sure you talk to Wayne early. So we'll talk about that later. Uh, so it doesn't happen and say, oh, I need to actually implement that in, in, in a month. You know, that should be a discussion that uh, so he, he has some awareness of the projects that are coming up. So that's really important. GA Moon, you've also been in touch with her, assistant director of educational programs. So thanks for doing a lot of the groundwork in the background here. So it's great, uh, great meeting so far. 
And of course, Erin Mori, you've been in touch with, with her as well. And that's her birthday. So happy birthday, Erin. <laughs> And again, if you have any questions related to the meeting, please feel free to reach out to them. Thanks a lot for organizing it. It's been great so far. So I first wanted to get a little bit into the progress uh, to date in terms of the research and trying to think a little bit like where, because a lot of you are involved in one single project, but trying to see where that project actually fits. You know, So you're going to see there's going to be several ways we can actually slice that down. It's actually not just 2D, but we'll see it's actually 3D now, the way we actually see that uh, in particular. I wanted to put a little bit of a woo-woo here so you know who's actually involved in the research. We have uh, Galen McKinley, Deputy Director here. Uh, we have Dave Lawrence, I saw Dave this morning. Yeah, our NCA uh, uh, Development Liaison. So he's very much involved into that discussion in like how do we actually involve and implement machine learning into the community or system model, but also discussing with NASA at least as well. We have Carl Vondrick, our data science director in the back there. <laughs> uh, Lorzana, I saw her here, geoscience director. And then we have also Tian Zhen, uh, chief uh, convergence officer and education director. So like wearing two hats, she's also chair of statistics. So she can do pretty much everything. Here. Okay, so I'm gonna frame that and no need to exactly look at the objectives, but you will see at the end, if you're interested, we have our strategic plan. If you really wanted to get a broader view of, of LEAP, that's where what you should be referring to. So th those are the different objectives that we have. Uh, the, the, the first uh, objectives are related to research, so that's why you have one, and then 1.1 is the first component of the objectives that we have. And really what we want, you know, that the first thing that we want to do is really improving parameterizations, right? That's going to be the primary goal. We want to actually, accelerate the development in the CSM, the Community or System Model, again at NCAL, which is our primary target. We're also collaborating with NASA GIS, but we are still trying to target as a primary uh, stakeholder, basically CSM. And there's a couple of challenges here. So uh, the, the first one that I mentioned before is that current parameterization do not really capture some of the emergent physical processes, such as clouds that we mentioned before. Again, because they have a pretty coarse rate, right? Or because we don't know exactly the physical processes at play. And the other challenge that we have is that we have plenty of data sets out there, plenty of, for instance, geostationary data sets or, or satellite observations, but we can barely use that again because of the data limitations that we have. So it's very, very complicated and very challenging to do that. And really the solution that we have here is to really use machine learning to extract information, you know, so that we can better represent those physical processes. So it's not just using terabytes of data, but making sense of this data. We had a nice chat yesterday actually with Ryan, we need to always look at some time series, looking at some plots, understanding what the physics and what the data is telling us. But you need to have uh, an efficient infrastructure to actually do so, right? It's not like what we used to do back in the days, just a single plot, right? We are talking about terabytes and petabytes of data. And we we have we have a couple of proofs of concepts. So we had a couple of ones, for instance, with Mike Pritchard, Andrew Gettleman, and DJ Gagne, Lorzana uh, uh, in particular showing that we can actually replace physical processes with machine learning. So we believe that can work at least within some idealized settings. And we are trying to actually leverage that and expand that to make sure that that can be fully implemented in all conditions. You know, so there are a couple of issues, potential bugs, et cetera, et cetera. But we want to, we have some proofs of concept so we feel confident that that could potentially work, right? So that's really a, a lot of the work that's going to be done in, in LEAP. And so if you're interested, I put some of the papers uh, here at the bottom. We also want, and that relates back to, to Carl here, is to also develop a new algorithm. So we have a few data scientists in the room here, and we're also trying to leverage causal understanding, right? Not, so not just correlation, but cause and effect. And we're also trying to include physical processes and physical understanding as well, right? So you will have, for instance, mass and energy conservation. You cannot lose mass, cannot lose energy. So that's something we want to do so we can have actually robust extrapolation and generalization outside of the training data. So that's something that's kind of a challenge, but we are actually trying to develop new algorithms in, along those. The other thing that we want to do, and that relates to one of the focus groups, so I'm going to discuss the focus groups in a minute. We want to also automatically calibrate and tune uh, the the components for now of the different Earth system models. So for instance, the land component, the atmospheric component, and for now, I mean, that's typically done manually. You know, like when you look at most climate models, people actually fine tune the model pretty much 
uh, manually, and we want to automatize that using actually inform metrics that we'll be discussing in a minute, right? So we want to actually make it more efficient, more optimal based on the suite of metrics here. And that's going to be one of the challenges that we are going to develop. And that's also one of the focus that we have, again, across those different focus groups. So this parameter inference or parameter estimation focus group, as we call it. Okay, so that's going to be one of the key challenges. And you will see there's a couple of examples. For instance, Katie Dagan has been work, doing some work. Greg, as I saw him yesterday. Uh, so they have been starting to do some work on the land side and on the atmospheric side at uh, NCAR or at NASA. So we believe that there's some potential there. Still a lot to be learned there to make it more efficient and more optimal. The other thing we want to do is try to advance model evaluation, right? So we want to actually develop new metrics, right? So typically we are looking at the evaluation kind of at the end of the pipeline. You know? So that, that's something relatively important. You develop your model based on some physical understanding or intuition and the observations or the metrics of success they come in really at the end of the development process, right? And we want to kind of change that. We want to flip that around its head, bringing the observations and the, 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 the metrics much earlier in the development process itself, right? So, and that's going to be a lot of the focus of the focus group on metrics, right? But again, we should not see that as being independent because of course, if you need to tune the parameters, you need to use metrics, right? So there's some clear connections across those different metrics. So if you sit in a particular focus group, make sure you talk to others, right? Because your metrics might inform some parameter in inference or some parameter estimation technique. So make sure that you have some uh, cross fertilization across. And you can actually sit in several focus groups, right? So it's not just because you're working on metrics that you only need to work on metrics. We've seen a couple of people actually sitting across focus groups. So that's great. And I wanted to maybe have a little bit of an interlude here uh, to start thinking a little bit about what we are actually trying to do when we think about new metrics for evaluation of parameterization, right? And again, as I was mentioning before, is that typically we want to change the way we use metrics in the development process, right? So typically metrics are used kind of at the end because there's a little bit of a silo between the model developer teams and, and, and then the, the, the metric teams. And we really want to merge that and making sure that the metrics come in much earlier in the development process so we can actually use that to refine the model structure or the model parameter. So kind of flipping that around instead and making sure the metrics are start really, really early in the development process. But again, that relies on a relatively good data infrastructure platform so we can actually use that at scale. So that's something we, we believe we can change. And it also means again, that there are some clear connections again between metrics and parameter parameter inference or parameterizations, right? So all of those focus groups are tightly connected through the use of metrics early in the development stage, okay? So that's something that presumably should be quite new in the way we are doing things. The second interlude I had on synergy, across, uh, again, is in terms of similarities between parameter inference or parameter estimation and parameterizations, right? So we typically see them as different beasts, right? So you're trying to tweak a few parameters that are left in your model, or you might have some, what we call a closure. You're trying to represent, say, clouds, or you're trying to represent uh, precipitation. But in fact, you could actually see those as being the same, right? So, and eventually what we'll have is we'll have a bunch of neural networks to represent some physical processes, and we will have some physical equations at the same time with a few parameters, right? But at the end of the day, you could treat them as just a bunch of parameters, right? And you could actually bridge that together. So if you're interested, I really refer you to Aziz's presentation where he's trying to actually do that and bring those things together. And it also means that, again, there's synergy across the different focus groups, right? Between parameter estimation from physical model that you, models that you want to tune and actually using closure based on your networks. We are just talking about a bunch of parameters. The question and the challenge will be, can we do that at scale? You know, and we'll be talking a little bit about that. But try to think about that long term, like those are not siloed, right? They are very, very strong synergies across, and we can use a lot of the same techniques such as Bayesian. The kind of final objective here is going to be at the end of the day, what we want to do, right? What we want to achieve by doing all of that, the parameter estimation, the new met metrics, and the new closures or the new parameterization is to basically establish new projections, right? So we want to use all of those data sets from observations, from high fidelity simulations, such as clouds that you can model really well, but on just a very small domain, 
and new algorithms as well. We want to bridge that together to develop those new parameterizations, so new ways we can actually represent physical processes. And then maybe making its way into, uh, uh, in that case, next generation CSM, it could be also the NASA GIS modeling model. And we hope that the ultimate goal will be an ultimate objective, having more accurate projections, such as for precipitation. And I think we should actually start looking at, at, at the past, you know. So you could say, okay, this is kind of wishful thinking, but in fact, it's kind of interesting looking at the weather forecast, you know. So everyone is actually looking at their phone on a regular basis. You want to know, like my son, for instance, can I play soccer at noon or at two because I have my friends coming up? And in fact, we don't appreciate that, but weather forecasting has become so accurate, right? And in fact, it's been what we call this quiet revolution over years, you know. So just showing here from the 80s to 2030, uh, 2013 here. So it's really interesting to see the forecast scale, right? We went from basically 80% to almost 99%, right? So the weather forecasting scale is extremely, extremely accurate. And we take that for granted, right? But that's something that's been evolving over the past the years. And why is that? It's because they've been able to actually ingest data at scale, right? They have, again, physical models that are deficient. But what they do is they actually combine them and merge them at scale very, very efficiently. They have very informed algorithms to do so, and actually a lot of engineers to actually do that. And they ingest a lot of different things, you know, radio soundings, satellite observations, in-situ observations. And that's why by merging that with the models, we can actually correct the different tra trajectories for the weather forecast, you know? And if your forecast is deficient, the, the observations will tell you that, and you can actually refine your forecast, right? So in a sense, and I, that's kind of an analogy, I mean, there's a lot of differences between climate and weather, but really just to show that the data revolution, we've seen that before, right? We've seen that for weather forecasting. And again, we take that for granted. And it didn't happen overnight. It took decades to actually do so. And of course, for LEAP, we should not expect that to happen over one year, but we hope that gradually we'll actually be reaching you know, the type of increase in accuracy and forecast scale that they are seeing. Okay, So that's actually, I hope, a vision for, for LEAP and for the community with not just us, M Square Lines, uh, uh, another project that a, a couple of us are actually inter involved in. So we hope that as a community, that's where we are actually go heading to for climate projection. Uh, to finish on the research, I wanted to explain a little bit how we are seeing the research. So. Typically, people will be, say, on the land side, they may, might be working on the ocean. But the way we already frame that in LEAP is more across data, uh, data spectrum from people that have what we call data rich data sets. They can generate a ton of data. They can actually, actually look at the future. They can generate future data, right? So we call that a data rich environment. You know, they can actually simulate even the future and use that to train their models. So they can use very uh, good kind of off the shelf. Uh, machine learning algorithms, they can maybe adapt them. And we have what we call moderate data, right? Where we might have some missing data. We only have data in the past. We don't know what the future is going to look like. And you need to do some sort of hybridization, right? You need to basically use some physical intuition or some physical knowledge along with machine learning. And I think a lot of the work in LEAP is going to be especially in the middle ground. All the way to the right hand side here, where you will be what we call data poor. You know, for instance, Streamflow would be a good example. You have just a few. A few, a few gauges here and there. You can just barely see a few watersheds. And so we are very, very data limited. So we need to use new techniques. So there has been some very interesting work, for instance, from Kumar's group looking at self supervised techniques. But that's another range here where we actually need to also use some sort of data knowledge uh, in some ways, right? So, but we see that as organizing the research more than the disciplines themselves, right? And we see and we hope that there's going to be a dialogue across those different. Uh, data uh, richness spectrum. And again, why do we want that? Because the center needs to be more than the sum of its parts, right? We want to organize and create synergies and collaborations across the different uh, entities. And we also kind of organize the research through another angle and another direction uh, uh, this year through the three different focus groups, as we call them. So we have, again, the parameterization group, the parameter estimation group, and the metrics group. But again, they are separated from now, but they could evolve over time, right? If we see a lot more connections, you know, some of them could merge. We could actually have some other ones. And if you actually very, you feel very strongly about it and you feel that we should actually have some new focus group, please reach out to us, right? I mean, that's something that could evolve. 
we are trying to optimize the way people collaborate and how we are actually creating synergy, but this is not set in stone. And that's actually meant to, to evolve over time. And the last thing, and that relates very much to, to Wayne uh, in the back here, is how we are also organizing research to make its way into the, the climate models themselves. So we see that as basically different levels of research from level one, which is kind of a proof of concept, to level two, which is kind of plugging that into some component of the climate model, uncoupled, not the full climate model, but some idealized setup, and all the way to the full like engineering task, which is which is to make sure that it's actually run, there's no bug, and we can actually use that for climate projections, right? So that's what we call level one to level two to level three. And across the years, we expect that those things will move and will change. And of course, right now we have most projects actually in level one because we are just starting, but we hope that throughout the years we'll actually moving, we'll be moving to more and more of the level three and make sure that when you're actually starting to reach level two, you reach out to Wayne, you know, so he has that, you know, on his roadmap and he knows that things are coming up, sorry. And that, you know, because for level three in particular, it would be highly involved. You know, that's really when Way will be the key player. Yeah. So just make sure you have that in your timeline and don't wait till the last minute to actually reach out to me. You know? so, that, so he has that on his agenda. Uh, quickly from, uh, so you're not alone. So we actually have quite a few people uh, in LEAP on the research side. So we have 14 PIs that are being supported. We had 16 funded project last year, 13 co-PIs, nine postdocs, nine PhD students. There's a, there's a joint call this year with the Data Science Institute. So that's, uh, we'll have to take a decision relatively shortly. And when we'll be at full steam, so next year we'll have another call for proposal and we'll have roughly 20 people like students and postdocs involved. So that will be quite a decent size cohort. And we hope that, you know, that will be a way to create a lot of legacy. And we hope that you will actually learn from each other. And we hope that in five or 10 years from now, we'll actually be saying, oh, that person was actually part of LEAP and they got those, this great job. And we'll see a lot of those progress to date in the lightning talk, so I don't want to mention that now. And just to give you a sense in terms of the levels, so we have actually two projects right now uh, on microphysics and superparameterization at level three, a couple of them in level two, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. But again, most of them are actually at the bottom in level one. So we are still at the proof of concept stage for most of the projects, and that's okay, you know, but through other years, you should try and map that through level two and level three. That should be one of the, the objectives. Moving on to education and what we've been ach achieving this year. So there's been a lot going on. So just wanted to present the team. So there's Tian Zheng uh, again. Uh, we have Jie Moon again uh, from the Educational uh, Assistant Director of Education. Charles Lang uh, right here, uh, who's gonna be our evaluator. And then Oren Pismoni Levy uh, also here. Uh, education liaison, especially with the Department of Education in the city of New York. And what we are trying to do, and that's also part of the strategic plan here, is we are trying to actually lower the, the, the bar and the entry point between data science and climate science, right? And basically, one of the main issues is jargon, right? So for instance, we always joke about one thing, which is, oh, I have this model, right? And it means a very different thing from a, for a climate scientist and for a data scientist, right? It could be a machine learning model, or it could be a climate model, right? So we need to start thinking about those things also when we present our work, like making sure that the other side can actually understand those things. So there's a lot of uh, 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 discrepancy between the jargon and the vocabulary and also the skill set, you know, like how people actually do their work as well. And so some of the objectives are to basically develop multiple entry points. So I'll mention some of that later. So to make sure that people can arrive and actually learn from the other side at different levels and really trying to also converge uh, data science and climate science for research, right? So that's the way we can actually work on a particular problem and making sure we can actually solve that all together. Uh, on the LEAP education program, so uh, we have quite a few things that were achieved this year. So I just wanna list some of them. So very important, we had the bootcamp that was actually a success last year and this year as well. We have a research uh, experience for undergrads. So if you're looking for an undergrad, we are gonna have uh, uh, actually one with Mike this year. So please, if you have some interest, redirect them to us. You know, they, they, we will get some great students last year. We also had last year some summer PhD students, what we call Momentum Fellows, that were also more on the data science side. So they have some entry point into climate science so to make sure they can actually 
uh, try working on that. And we have a couple of collaborations, in particular with NCAR SOS, which is a great program for undergrads, especially uh, targeting minorities. So it's uh, uh, we've been trying to be uh, much more in collaboration with them. And the Amazon Shores uh, program as well, which is also for people more on the machine learning side. So again, trying to get some entry points from either side. And uh, to be announced pretty soon, we'll have some partnership with the American Museum of Natural History. So really excited about that. So looking forward to seeing that. And uh, just last week, actually, uh, 10 days ago, we had a boot camp actually organized uh, at Columbia for people that are typically at the postdoc plus level. So that's a great way if you feel that you don't have the, the skill set, you know, please reach out or uh, uh, join those boot camps. They are a great way to actually get into that. And that was a great success. I think we got a lot of feedback and we had some great uh, data points showing that people had very limited knowledge about climate data before on the cloud. And they could actually do a quite a bit of things after the bootcamp and say from machine learning, they could actually run a neural network using uh, climate data. So that was really exciting. And just in two days, again, through the very nice data infrastructure that we now have. So that's great. Uh, coming up soon, you know, for, so I mentioned the um, uh, partnership with the American uh, National uh, um, uh, History Museum. So we will have also the new IEU program. So if you hear about students that are interested, please uh, redirect them to us and to GA in particular. We are looking for great undergrads. They, they can do great work. We had one of them that was actually pre presenting at AGU. So they do amazing research and they are really, really involved. They are really passionate also about using their skill sets, especially a lot of people on the machine learning side that want to actually do uh, climate science as well. We will have a summer institute that Oren is organizing for educators as well to get some basic understanding. So again, this kind of knowledge transfer, some understanding of what LEAP is about, the value of climate data, and how that can actually be useful for educators, especially uh, K-12. And uh, we will ask for your help, you know, so please, we are going to try and create some material, especially some online material on climate science uh, in particular. So if you're interested and you want to provide a video, we would love to actually get you involved, you know. So LEAP is not about just about research, but also education. So we love to actually get you involved. And it's not a big ask. It's not too much of your time, but that would actually be extremely useful for us. So please reach out to GA or to Tian in that case. And I would like to mention we'll have one thing. So we thought that we also needed to create some convergence from the bottom up. So we are also creating this spring, what we call a convergence luncheon. So if you're at Columbia, there's going to be some food. And we will try to have advisors and advisees from different disciplines. People will present their work. And we will try to actually create synergies across disciplines. So if you're, for instance, in stats and you want to apply your skill set and you want to look at some projects, that would be a great way to start creating those synergies across different disciplines. And if you're, for instance, at NCAR, maybe we can provide food online. You know, and you, you, can, you can gather there. We talked about that with Linia. Uh, so you could have a small group. And we, can, we have a great hybrid setup. So we could actually do that at the same time. So maybe for you, it would be breakfast. So that's for the education. And just to conclude on the knowledge transfer side of LEAP. So, uh, so that's the team. So Courtney Cogburn here in the room. Uh, Catherine Shah again here. Uh, Erin as well. Uh, Vanessa Burbano, our corporate uh, <laughs> uh, engagement director. And Rafkin, I don't know. I saw him yet, right there. And again, Charles Lang and Oren uh, Pismoni Levy. We also have carbon plants. I think they are in the back. Thanks for coming, guys. And you will see they are doing great work again uh, across uh, different uh, aspects of cloud data. And especially on the knowledge transfer, you will see they are developing a fantastic data visualization platform for climate data. So, really, really excited about that. And that's, in a nutshell, how we envision that, you know, in terms of the data visualization, is that we will have a bunch of climate data for now, like we will use existing climate data, but in the long run, we hope to have like some specific leap data. And we will actually have that on the cloud so that people can actually just use that directly on their laptop through their own, own internet uh, uh, platform. And then you will have this nice, nice data visualization platform. So you could start looking at specifics, for instance, number of heat wave days in New York, or if you want to look at flooding events in a particular region, all of that through your laptop, you know, so that will be just based on this cloud infrastructure. You will need, and uh, you, you won't need to have a lot of compute power on your computer. And so we believe that it will really raise the bar in terms of being more inclusive, like the way we actually use climate data, and also more diverse, right? So that will be reaching a much broader team and much broader range of stakeholders. And 
we believe that this is a great way towards more efficient and broader climate adaptation in the end. Really, that will be the ultimate goal. That platform should really lower the bar to actually use climate data, which can be really uh, very difficult to use right now and, and uh, a bit intimidating as well. And that's basically how it looks like. So you will have these data visualizations. You could actually have some time series, just a schematic is just a prototype for now. And, but that will actually provide really a great way to do uh, a, a great knowledge transfer of the climate data. And the same data, again, will be used for research and education, right? So there's clear transparency in the way we actually use climate data. So that will be very, very efficient. And there's also going to be a data catalog as well. So you could actually start browsing what type of data you want and what type of data you would want to plot. And that will actually be provided for this uh, platform as well. So, and so it's small, I have some bug because I, I'm on a Mac. So what was happening last year in terms of KT, so I don't need to go through the entire list, but we had our seminar series. So uh, you can join online. So if you're uh, remote, so that's fine. Everything is hybrid there. We started some uh, KT partnerships. So you'll hear more about that in a few minutes, actually, with uh, our future is science and the World Economic Forum in particular. We started, again, this collaboration with Carbon Plan in terms of the data infrastructure. So that's been a, a great uh, a, a partnership there. And we are starting to also organize the partnership that we have with various private and public stakeholders as well. Try to make sure you actually register to the LEAP newsletter to kind of hear about, uh, Catherine is in charge of that, to make sure you hear about the latest things every week. Uh, and we will also hire a, a postdoc, really especially to uh, at, at um, uh, looking at how climate adaptation and climate information can be helpful for a range of stakeholders on, on the public and private side. Coming up this year, so we will have, very importantly, at the end of April, we will have a meeting showing the data visualization platform. So that will be our big milestone on, on the KT side, you know, like showing how we can actually use data. So if you're interested or you know partners that would be interested, please reach out to us. Uh, again, we got a fellowship from the World Economic Forum to look at how climate data can actually be useful for the public and private sector as well. Uh, we started actually developing collaborations in terms of outreach to educators, especially with RN, uh, with the Summer Institute, trying to make sure that people could also use this climate data. They can actually use that in the classroom as well. And we started also engaging more with the corporate and the community stakeholders, and that's basically going to, to be leveraged this year. Uh, and we are also starting to have videos and podcasts, you know, so if you're interested to participate there as well, very similar to the education side, please reach out. We're always looking for great content that we can actually publicize. So, and we had some great podcasts from, uh, from Andrew like a couple of weeks back. So that was great. Okay, so just to conclude about what we are trying to achieve um, in this meeting, so I'm going to be brief here. So really the overarching goal here is to really build the LEAP community, right? We want to make sure we are developing a cohort and creating legacy here in terms of people, so making sure that people know each other, that they can collaborate. And on the research side, we want to make sure that people can present their progress, but also trying to find new collaborations or synergies across, right? So don't think yourself like if you just work on land, you know, and you see someone working on the atmosphere, there might be connections between the work, right? So try to look at what's going on here, talk to people, and there might be some great synergies. And that's really the advantage of being a center as opposed to being just a single project, right? We are trying to leverage that. On the education side, we again want to engage you in the, uh, on the educational components. So if you're interested in providing content or participating in classes or courses, please reach out to us. We're always looking for uh, some additional content. And again, education is a key component to actually create this climate and data science convergence. Uh, we'll hear more about data and computing in a few minutes on the LEAP and Geo infrastructure. So you'll hear more about that, how we can actually now use climate data at scale, right? And you will see it's really, really efficient. So I think that's gonna be one of the primary objectives. And we hope that you will only be using the hub uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks because that can really accelerate your research, especially when you're dealing with very, very large data sets. And on the knowledge transfer side, we kind of see that two ways, like convergence internal, so making sure that people can communicate across disciplines, not just data science and climate science, but also within the climate science community as well. So we will have some evaluation here, so people will be involved to actually see how well we are doing, like in terms of communicating across the room, yeah, to make sure that people understand what they are actually seeing. 
And then it was also a way to actually show you what is going on on the knowledge transfer side outside. Like again, for instance, the data visualization platform, the partnership that we have, for instance, with our future is science or the World Economic Forum. So showing that, again, LEAP is more than just education and research, right? There's a big knowledge transfer component. And then on the DEI side, so diversity, equity, and inclusion, we want to establish and evaluate some baseline DEI competencies. So you had this survey, and again, if you haven't filled up this survey, make sure you do. Uh, so we can actually start thinking about progress and where and what are the gaps that you have. And they are, it's quite exhaustive. So please make sure you answer that. And really what we want at the end is really developing transdisciplinary science, right? So again, across many disciplines, again, data science, climate science, but also within uh, a particular dom domain, also with the knowledge transfer. And really, I wanted to mention it requires some level of humility, right? Because at the end of the day, no single uh, field or no single discipline is better than the other one. We need everyone in the room here. So I hope you're really trying to listen to the other perspectives and trying to learn from, from each other. So humility is going to be a big component, I think, of transdisciplinary research. So all components are critical for leap success and not just one particular component. And again, the center is more than individual, individual projects, right? We're really looking at synergies across in terms of algorithms, approaches, training, et cetera. So really seeing that, trying to take advantage of being together in the room, being together in the training. So we are more than the sum of all. And I wanna mention again that the center is gonna be very supportive across of all sorts of synergies and cross fertilization. So if you see opportunities for synergies or cross collaborations, please reach out, we are happy to support that. Again, we are trying this new convergence luncheon as a, as a way to kind of leverage that and make sure there's also some kind of bottom-up uh, 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 development of, uh, of synergies, right? That maybe is not just imposed from the top down based on the structures the structure that we have, that we have, such as from the faculty. And I just like to quickly mention the values that we had. So I mentioned the mission before. So the key values that we have are innovation because we want to develop knowledge, especially to learn new things as well, not just improving climate uh, projections. We really believe in diversity because connecting and across and also respecting different perspectives can really foster like new developments and actually achieve our goals. We also believe in legacy, which is a key theme for, for us. We have a new cohort here and we really hope that you all will actually do great in the future. So we really wanna build lasting scientific knowledge and new research, uh, a new research community as well. And we believe that through those values, we'll actually reach our final value, which is impact. So that's actually part of our strategic plan. So if you're interested, you can actually reach that more. And again, impact in terms of specifically climate projections for climate adaptation. And just to conclude, so uh, because a lot of people ask for those things, so it's actually not related specifically to this meeting, but we have a lot of our central documents on the website, you know, so just go to leap.columbia.edu. A lot of people ask, so we have most of the things there, like strategic plan is there. We have our operation manual if you want to know how things are functioning or if you're unclear on some things. We have our bylaws as well and the membership and space policy. So some people are aware unclear about the membership, how do you actually become a member? Feel free to actually read, read that through. If you're at Columbia and you want to apply for space, that's actually, you can actually directly go there and you, you will see how you can apply. The last thing I wanted to mention as part of the documents, very important, we have our code of conduct uh, and especially important for this meeting. So really we want, will not accept any type of bullying, uh, sexual misconduct, harassment or discrimination. And we really want to have a safe and supportive environment again, so that we can actually build a safe and, 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 and synergistic community. So with that, and if you have any issues, you can report that to a Courtney in that case. So with that, I hope you have a stimulating and enjoyable meeting. And if you have any questions, happy to take that. Thanks. Thanks, Galen, and thanks everyone for being here. So it's great to be uh, starting off this uh, lightning talk session. And uh, well, I'm gonna be talking about our uh, level one LIP uh, internal project, physics data-driven surrogate models for biosphere-atmosphere uh, interaction. Uh, this is a collaboration between myself, uh, Jacob Fish, Carl Vondrick, uh, Enshen Wang, Jian Yang from Colombia, and Dave Lawrence from Anchor. And this project really has just started with the hire of uh, uh, Ji Yang. So we're gonna mostly be focusing on motivation and uh, the research plan. So why do we wanna study biosphere atmosphere interaction? Well, the, the reason is that this interaction controls the exchanges of heat, moisture, and gases between the biosphere and the atmosphere. 
and this in turn affects uh, our climate. Um, these exchange in, changes occur over a broad range of uh, temporal and spatial scales. Um, they're governed by turbulence, which is a multi-scale phenomenon interacting with multi-scale canopy. So it's pretty complex uh, uh, physical system. Uh, in climate models, uh, we modeled these interactions using a formalism that was introduced back in the late 70s, known as the big leaf uh, approach. Uh, this approach envisions uh, uh, models a canopy as a single leaf, a single layer, um, with a given wind speed, temperature, and, and humidity interacting with the underlying soil and the atmosphere aloft. Uh, and uh, well, the interaction is uh, mostly captured via algebraic or differential 1D relations, uh, trying to map state variables uh, between the canopy, the soil, and the atmosphere with corresponding exchange rates. These are trying to mimic the effect, uh, the aggr time aggregate and area aggregate effects of, of turbulence. So it's a very simple model for emulating or simulating a very complex phenomenon. So it's reasonable that it's not, can be expected to work well under all possible circumstances. There are more sophisticated models that uh, layer the canopy uh, into, into multiple layers so that the, there can be some processes directly resolved within the canopy. These are expected to be a bit better, but we know that the real world is much more complex than that. The trees can be of varying height, varying density, they can be deployed heterogeneously in space, and this affects their interaction with turbulence and the exchange rates. And even within a single tree, you can uh, observe a lot of spatial variability, right? The clumping of branches, tree uh, foliage, etc. cetera. Uh, this heterogeneity, when you couple it with turbulence, which is itself a multi-scale phenomenon, makes it uh, uh, like for a very uh, multi-scale and, and complex phenomenon to, 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 to model. Um, the main idea uh, in this project is to go beyond the single leaf or multi-layer approach uh, and instead make use of uh, multi-scale methods, which are computational methods that have had a lot of success in the mechanical and aerospace engineering uh, fields, especially for solid mechanics. Uh, the idea be behind these methods is that uh, you can solve a multi-scale problem, not with a single solver, but by using different solvers, each one taking care of a different range of scales. Um, so you'll have a system of solvers, basically, each one tackling a simpler problem, and these are coupled, and uh, the system will give you the end result, let's say, that is the, the full solution. Uh, and we expect that this should uh, improve the accuracy when compared to, to existing model. Um, this is the plan. We're planning to first develop the, the multi-scale model, possibly then develop a surrogate based on machine learning, uh, maybe just for some of the scales, in fact, uh, those that are more challenging to tackle with, with pure physics. Uh, and then uh, we'll tailor this model for a LiDAR point cloud data of vegetation and hopefully validate it for, uh, against in situ measurements for a realistic uh, canopy environment. Uh, this is a level zero project. This is going to be a proof of concept, and we hope that yeah, in the, it will we'll find some, some good, let's say, that can be later be implemented in, in climate models. Um, Yep, this is it, and thank you for your attention. Hi, everyone. So I'm Johnny Kingsley um, from Le Mans and Dees, and uh, I originally had my full title for our project up here, um, but I, I opted for a simpler thing just about ice sheet sliding. So I'm going to explain to you uh, f uh, in, a, in a relatively straightforward way what ice sheet sliding is, and so that people can have their problem in their minds and think about how we can tackle it with machine learning. We have some ideas and we're going to, but part of being here is, is to gather more, um, is to develop more, more detail on that. So what are ice sheets? Um, maybe I could just move this. Yeah, so the ice sheets are thick accumulations of ice which form at the poles, where, wherever it's cold enough in the winter to snow and not warm enough in the summer to melt all that snow away, it accumulates into hundreds or thousands of meters thick accumulations of ice. And uh, we've got two ice sheets on the planet, but we've got 220,000 smaller glaciers up in mountains. So they're another important part of the hydrological cycle, which, uh, which Marco's talk was all about. So they're large enough, ice sheets are large enough so that changes in their mass affect sea level globally. And so that's why we care about ice sheets. One of the reasons is that we need to be able to predict how the ice sheets will change in responses to into in response to warming oceans and warming atmosphere 
so that we can better predict sea level rise. And that's important for coastal communities around the world. So the really interesting thing about ice is it flows viscously under its own weight, and it also slides across the bedrock beneath. So actually at the interface, the ice is moving across the rock or sediments beneath. And the way that we describe that sliding is very, very simplistic in models today. And that's what we're talk, ta gonna tackle in this project. This is, a, this is a, a map of the flow speed of the Antarctic ice sheet. And you can just, just get an idea of the complexity of this, of, this, of this flow field. And a lot of that's to do with sliding. Sliding varies a lot in different, different places. And we wanna be able to predict it uh, or model it today and also see how it will change as the ice sheet thins and shrinks. So that's really important. Um, how much detail to get into? I'm not sure, but basically the ice is flowing downhill under its own weight and resisting that flow uh, is drag generated at the base. And there's two components of drag. One is just the friction between the ice and the, and the sediment or the rocks at that interface at a small scale. The other one is viscous flow around bumps. So this is the bedrock beneath, this is the ice and this is the atmosphere. And the ice has to flow up and down these bumps. And these bumps exist on all scales down to grain scale or continent scale, mountain range scale. So the ice has to flow up and down and that generates drag as well. And so, uh, but this is a typical grid, grid scale. Uh, picking up on the themes from Pierre's talk, this is a grid point and this is another grid point. And they're vertical lines because it's all vertically integrated. But it's missing out all this stuff, basically. And so the way that we describe sliding lumps all these things together at that grid scale. So it just says all the drag in that grid box is coming from some simple, simple sliding law, like maybe that one on the left. It's just the shear stress is equal to a constant times the speed, highly simplistic. It could be a little bit more complicated, like the one on the right, but in general, it's very, very simple. And then we keep those parameters constant in time across our simulations. But uh, we know a lot about the physics of flow, uh, oh, sorry, the physics of form drag, that flow up and down bumps is basically viscous deformation. We know quite a lot about it. So the idea for this project is to simulate that at a smaller scale, uh, which would be uh, impractical to do across large scales, but simulate it at a small scale and then emulate those physics with a machine learning approach. So we have this idea of a this is all just physics-based simulation, which we can do today. You have a bunch of inputs. You have a viscous flow solver solving, solving the Stokes equations, actually. And it's generating a drag, an apparent drag at that coarse grid scale. So the idea is to essentially emulate these physics um, with a machine learning algorithm to make everything efficient enough to operate at large scale. This is highly simplistic. I'm sure there's going to be lots and lots of um, complexities, but this is our first aim at a first proof of concept, a machine learning-based sliding law. So um, I feel like I'm running out of time, but here's the summary. Ultimately, we want to pr improve how ice sheets, ice sheet models describe sliding at, the, at, that, at that interface by using machine learning. Okay, thank you. It, 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 well, it's, it's, it could be accounted for in this project. It definitely is important. It generates water, and that water lubricates that interface. And for example, this sliding law describes that by this N, which is an effective pressure, which is the difference between water pressure and ice overburden pressure. So that could be certainly incorporated. And it's a, a George Liu, who introduced himself yesterday, his project is all about water at the base. So, yeah, definitely important. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so this project is about um, uh, deep learning based inverse modeling. And the idea is that the, um, the environmental systems are often modeled by geoscientific or physical models that can be viewed as a mapping uh, between inputs like the weather drivers or outputs like the stream flow in a hydrological basin. And usually this relationship is determined by some characteristics of this environmental system. For example, in a river catchment, uh, for the same amount of rain, a different amount of stream flow may be observed depending upon the characteristic of the soil and many, many other properties. 
And this is where you see bulk of the work that sort of happens at the interface of machine learning and scientific modeling. That is, people are trying to build machine learning models that are more accurate representations of these forward uh, scientific models. But this project is about inverse modeling, uh, and that sort of is needed when these characteristics, the Z, uh, are either unknown, and they may be of interest just by themselves, or you may need them to improve your forward modeling, which would be the case in this project, for example, in the context of parameter estimation or, or even calibration. Uh, and, and the question is, how do you uh, sort of do a, you find these characteristics of, of a system just by observing its uh, response to its driver. So the physical, the drivers that are determining the response, but there are characteristics of the system that, that sort of modulate this driver response relationships. And you're trying to figure out these characteristics. The inverse modeling is a, um, a long studied problem in physical sciences. And oftentimes people would basically uh, sort of assume that, that they have certain values, possible space of values for these parameters. And they would do a grid search on those values by running the forward models multiple times to see which one of those values actually have a best match. Now this approach of course has a number of limitations. One of them is of course extremely compute intensive because the forward models are compute intensive. You have to run them for all of these possible combinations. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, this way of finding uh, uh, the, the characteristics, this inverse modeling approach to finding characteristics is limited inherently by the limitations of your forward model. Uh, and which means it's not using the, uh, the available observed data as effectively as you can. So this project is about basically building a uh, machine learning approach to uh, uh, inverse modeling. Uh, and of course, in the context of uh, climate modeling enterprise. Uh, and this is also sort of novel from the machine learning perspective in the sense that as I mentioned earlier, tremendous amount of work in machine learning and the forward modeling uh, but very little on, uh, uh, on the inverse model. So this project is, is basically building uh, these inverse uh, characteristics as embeddings, and, and these embeddings are, uh, are, are a phenomenal way of sort of capturing the information in data, and, and these sort of these models are self-supervised. Uh, and, and since I'm about out of time, I'm just gonna give you just a couple of results in the context of these CAMELS hydrological data set and for which we are able to show that these characteristics can be reconstructed uh, very effectively uh, using you know, even though some earlier approaches. Even if you know nothing about the characteristics, the embeddings that are constructed by machine learning algorithms actually look very similar to the, the known characteristics. And even more importantly, they can actually be better in some, in some respect in the sense that they could potentially improve your forward modeling tremendously using limited amount of data. And again, the, our poster sort of, of course, has a lot more details on it, and I am um, to talk about it. If you come by, we'll talk about our future plans and, and, and what we like to discuss. With. So I guess with that, if we can any questions. Hi, everyone. My name is Aya Lalu. I'm first year PhD in Pierre's lab which is constraining phonology. Uh, so this project I have just um, started, um, but I would like to talk more about some of the motivation and the future plans of this work. Um, so first of all, a lot of people ask me when I talk to them about my research, what is phonology really? And it's the, st the study of annual life cycles of um, plants from bud bursts all the way to um, leaf coloration, all the way to um, leaf falling out. Uh, and the motivation behind uh, this project is that um, leaf phenology is one of the main indicators of climate change. Um, it has also a great uh, impact in the control of carbon uptake of the planet. And it also serves as a great feedback for the water cycle um, for um, and energy fluxes in our ecosystems. Um, it is also very important to uh, work on uh, constraining phenology because it is a difficult task to uh, predict uh, due to the many drivers that go into, um, uh, into this process. So there are, first of all, climate factors such as temperature, 
uh, precipitation, radiation, et cetera. There's also multiple factors that uh, are not really observable. Um, and of course, uh, some of the importance stems from how much it informs on um, climate change response, as well as like its impacts and econ economic health and ecological um, sites. So for our methods, uh, we're using uh, data uh, first from satellite observations, so multi-decadal uh, data of a, veg a vegetation indicator. Here specifically, we're using contiguous solar-induced fluorescence, um, which is um, uh, from the moderate resolution image um, as a proxy for uh, the photosynthetically absorbed um, radiation. And this has been also developed in uh, Pierre's lab we're also using climate data in addition to that as a uh, first predictor. Um, so climate data such as temperature, precipitation, and radiation. Uh, and for the machine learning uh, model side of things, uh, we're deciding to uh, use a model including time recurrence because of the importance of uh, the number of days below or um, above a threshold in plant phenology. Uh, multiple uh, plant phenology events are uh, started because of like the number of days that are under like a specific temperature, for example. Um, so we are first thinking of using long short term memory fitted across different uh, plant functional um, types. Um, so a lot of this work is in progress. Some of the future plans that we have, of course, is feeding the start of season and the end of season temporal data. Um, as well as, as we talked about before, uh, developing uh, new metrics and uh, good metrics to know and evaluate our uh, models, as well as the testing. So the testing will first be done offline, then on uh, long-term simulations. And uh, finally, we'd like to improve our um, uh, models by using um, meta-learning and seeing how it can like improve our predictions, as well as new attention mechanisms. Um, that can uh, that usually behave well in like long term uh, time series projects. Um, and just to rewind uh, the prediction, the prediction goals here are uh, to better predict the start of senescence period, the start of the leafing out period, as well as the peak of vegetation indexes. Um, and we have some expectations in terms of um, what to expect, such as like in higher temperatures, we have like an earlier start of season, um, delayed end of season. Finally, for the discussion points, there are still challenges in uh, this research area, such as the impacts of extreme climates on leaf phenology. This is something that has not been researched yet, as well as the lack of regional diversity and trying to work more on tropical and subtropical regions. Thank you. Right, correct. Um, so for the meta learning, um, I guess, as it is like known as learning how to learn or having like uh, a better uh, idea of um, when we have like metadata like in our hands, uh, how to improve like our models or how like to use like new uh, models such as uh, perhaps like transformers or um, new methods to see how like this could be used. Uh, we can talk about it like more in the poster presentation, but there are definitely a lot of like new additions and um, new releases in like the machine learning like industry that can be used in this. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kara Lamb. I'm a research scientist at Columbia. And I'll talk about our project, which has this long title unification of data via, via learning algorithms for robust models of ice microphysics. But the main idea is that we're interested um, in improving our understanding of ice uh, formation in clouds like cirrus clouds. So um, I'll start with some motivation. So these are the reflectances from cirrus clouds from MODIS over about eight years. So you can see that there's a lot of cirrus cloud formation in like the high and mid latitudes. And you also see that kind of band of cirrus clouds that form around uh, the tropics. Um, so just in, to define cirrus clouds, I'm talking about those thin wispy ice clouds that form high up in the atmosphere. And the reason that we're really interested in them for climate is um, basically two reasons. Um, they have important radiative effects. So basically what the light that they reflect um, from the sun. 
And um, that band of cirrus clouds that you see forming in the tropics is also important um, for regulating the amount of water vapor that is in the stratosphere because a lot of the um, upwelling of uh, from the trop from the troposphere, the slowest level of the atmosphere that we live in, um, happens in that that tropical region. It passes through this tropical tropopause layer, which is this very cold, dry region of the atmosphere. And so um, this is important because water vapor in the stratosphere is actually an important greenhouse gas. Um, so current climate models represent ice microphysics in these clouds in a very highly simplified way, and they don't actually treat ice crystal habits consistently. So that's what we're interested in um, improving with our project. So the main idea is to combine disparate observational data sources that we have to reduce both structural and parametric uncertainty in physics-based models of ice growth. So we have a number of different types of data sets that um, can give us some constraints on ice microphysics. Um, but they all have different advantages and disadvantages. So there's things like single crystal laboratory experiments that give us very precise um, conditions. Uh, we have cloud chambers experiments. These are basically these larger um, experimental simulations of clouds within a laboratory. Um, we also have a lot of uh, aircraft and balloon observations now, and these basically give us really detailed information in the atmosphere, but they're really just snapshots in time. So we don't know anything about the past um, history of ice growth. Um, from, from these snapshots. And then we have remote observations like radar that gives us a lot more spatial and temporal coverage, but it doesn't give us much um, local um, environmental conditions that are really um, important for the ice growth process. So our methods are kind of dependent on the different data sources. So a lot of work, the work that's been done in the past few years by um, one of the collaborators on the project, Jerry Harrington, um, and his group has been developing and evalu evaluating physics-based models in these single lab um, crystal laboratory experiments. So this project will focus mostly on um, these next three data sources. So um, using cloud chamber observations to evaluate and constrain the parameters developed in the single crystal laboratory experiments um, in these uh, larger cloud and um, sort of these um, larger cloud chamber experiments. Um, and for the aircraft and balloon observations, we want to combine many past observations to reduce structural uncertainty in physics-based models. And then finally, uh, with some of the remote observations, we might be able to refine these parameters in true um, in atmospheric can re refine the parameter constraints in the true atmospheric conditions using things like Bayesian inference. Um, so some of the work that has been done so far has been looking at cloud chamber observations. So these are data sets that were taken um, in the AIDA cloud chamber at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Um, so here we basically get time series. Um, this is showing um, uh, the aggregated effects of ice growth. So we don't look at it on for individual crystals, but rather in the entire cloud. And then we can um, look at comparing the um, types of models that were developed in the single crystal laboratory experiments um, to these time series, and then like varying the parameters to see how sensitive it is. Um, so that's sort of the initial work that's been done that we can, um, the ice growth rates in AIDA can generally be modeled with these physics-based models that were developed from the single crystal laboratory experiments, but they show greater deviations at colder temperatures. Um, and so now we're also working on using things like MCMC to um, get uh, parameter constraints um, on these specific parameters. Uh, so what we're just getting started on with um, LEAP is um, using a lot of the aircraft and balloon observations. And for this, we have a number of different images of ice crystals. So we have these very, very high resolution images of ice crystals that were collected within clouds. Um, and we also have a large number of this large database of about 12 million um, CPI images. These are from past NASA and DOE funded aircraft campaigns. Um, and so our idea here is that we want to use methods like autoencoders um, to try to figure out what are the principal growth axes within the observed ice crystals in the atmosphere. And we could come up with things like data-driven ice crystal habit diagrams. And then eventually we, we may want to also use uh, things like radar observations to refine parameter constraints and true atmospheric conditions. And then eventually to integrate this into climate models, um, the, the obvious place to do this would be through developing models for the ice mass size relationship, which can be um, directly integrated with the single ice category of Puma's microphysics scheme um, in CES in the community or system model. So a couple of different um, discussion points that I guess I'd be interested in discussing with uh, machine learning practitioners and data scientists about 
like how we might be able to use the images that are 2D um, to get more 3D information, um, like putting physical constraints in the latent space for these autoencoders. Um, can we infer a sequence from a series of images? And yeah, and so anyway, please come talk to me if you have any ideas. I'm Robert Pincus. I'm at Lamont um, at Columbia University. Uh, what we're uh, what we're doing here, and I should mention that the student working on this is Dion Ho, who's in the middle row there at uh, Math at Columbia Law as well. Um, what we're trying to do is tune the formulation of one of these subgrid scale models. The model itself is related to radiation. Why is that relevant? It's relevant because it controls the climate to first order, the way that the the planet exchanges energy with the rest of the universe is through radiation, meaning light, um, the light that comes in from the sun and the light that is emitted by the earth. We're interested in the fate of sunlight in this project. And that's because as Kara was just showing you, um, part of the energy budget is that the light is reflected back to space. And we're interested in the, the representation of that process of reflection. Um, any model of the climate, any numerical model of the climate will want to account for this reflection, so this flow of radiation. Um, radiation is unusual, not only in that it depends on space and that it's multi-scale and all these other things that you've heard about, but, th but that it depends on direction. So there's uh, two whole axes of variability in our problem that are not present in anybody else's and um, that are a headache. The very first thing that we do in a treatment of radiation in any one of these models is we restrict that flow to up and down. So that's called a two stream approximation, two streams of light, one going up and down. And that is, uh, there's a simplification, there's a mathematical simplification that we make. And in doing that mathematical simplification, we create these sort of intermediate variables that are not, that wind up of course having numerical values at a certain point, but they're formulas, they're equations. So that the coupling, how much light goes up versus down depends on the characteristics of the atmosphere. Yeah, so that's these coupling coefficients. And so what we want to do, um, what we want to do is, uh, so the way these coupling coefficients are formulated, the equations we use, were um, historically done because they were things that you could write down with pencil and paper. And that's the thing we want to revise with machine learning. So in order to build this uh, target, we need the ability to make the fully angular calculations. So that's the first thing we need to do. Uh, and then we need to explore the range of possible conditions. In this way, our problem is lucky because there are, we know precisely there are three variables that we need, uh, and, two, and two of them are physically constrained, you know, between zero and one or between minus one and one or whatever they are, but um, they're, they're quite, the phase space, as we would call it, is quite small. Um, and so we can sample that space exhaustively, um, which is kind of neat. Um, and so what we are doing is um, using sort of well-established uh, algorithms or techniques to do the reference calculation, to do the calculation which is angularly resolved. We'll explore the part of the phase space. And then we want to build first statistical models, so get the right number that makes the approximate calculation, the one that ignores all the angular detail, match the complicated, uh, well, yeah, let's say you, you will average the complicated calculation. And we want those two, the simple representation and the average of the complicated calculation to agree. And we'll, focus, we'll do that first focusing on the numerical values themselves, and then using things like uh, equation discovery, we hope to find new formulas that represent uh, these, these things best. So that work is being done by Dion, who just started. Interestingly, he uh, recoded in Python uh, our reference calculation because the Fortran that was available was um, hard to use from our, in a machine learning context. Um, and this, I think, is maybe the, the place I would stop, which is on these discussion points. Dion, being a scientist getting his PhD, has written a bunch of code that could, in principle, be widely useful. How much time uh, should he be investing in um, making that available in a wider context? And how much support could he get from LEAP in making that available in a wider context is a point of discussion I'd like to raise. But thanks. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm a sociologist, I'm not a STEM person. The last time I took a science class was in high school. 
So I'm enjoying the conversation and I'm learning a lot. Thank you. Um, I study social movements and how social movements try to change schools. So in that spirit, like Sean Penn in the movie uh, about Harvey Milk, I'm here to recruit you. So if you have your cell phones, I hope it's okay to use it for a couple of seconds. Go ahead and scan this um, figure. And that's where I'm going to ask you to give me your name, your email, and what you're interested in helping us uh, in this summer institute that I'm going to tell you about. But it's okay. You'll have the opportunity to do it later also. So climate change uh, is important. Everybody knows that. And we need to engage uh, K-12 students, the next generation. Um, here are a couple of uh, data points that we know about climate change from the work I'm doing with the Department of Education in New York City, the largest school district in the country, by the way, 1.1 million students. So educators are concerned about climate change more than the average population, by the way. They are already engaging with climate change with about one third saying that they teach about climate change at least three, four lessons per year. Uh, those who don't do that say that it doesn't relate to those subject matter. We need to work on that. They have, they suffer from lack of knowledge and materials. We need to work on that. And they have low self-efficacy saying that they are not prepared to teach this kind of uh, content. So I want to show you the challenges that we have in addition to this, and then to tell you how I think that we as LEAP can actually address this gap. So let's look at figure number one. You can see that teachers are really confused about what caused climate change. For people in this room, this is not a question. However, half of the teachers in New York City still believe that both natural patterns and human activity cause climate change. So we have an issue here that we can all help them to figure out why this is actually about humans and not other reasons. Second, we have issues with how much they uh, perceive the risk of climate change on their own communities. So teachers think that uh, climate change will harm future generations, people in developing countries, plants and animals, everything that is far away from them. And they don't think that it's going to uh, harm themselves or their students. And here we have some experiments that we did. I'm more than happy to talk about it if people are interested. So we have an issue with projection, the main thing that LEAP is going to do. And we have the issue of a risk perception, another thing that we can all help them to figure out. But this is not the only challenge. It's not about knowledge and perception. It's also about DEI. So here are, in figure number three, I'm showing you that schools that serve white kids are more likely to engage them with climate. So we have a big gap in the opportunities to engage with climate. And second, and this is figure number four, a study that was inspired, thank you, a study that was inspired by my participation in LEAP, showing that teachers perceive kids who are low SCS or non-white, BIPOC, they perceive them as less interested in climate. Okay, so we have multiple issues on how schools as racialized organizations, how they actually do a bad job in engaging everybody with climate. So what we are going to do here, we, are, we have a mission for the Summer Institute to really engage teachers with climate. We have a structure of four days in the summer and uh, a couple of days in the fall and spring. And what I want everybody here is really to help us with sharing your knowledge you all are using wonderful metaphors. Over dinner, I heard about metaphors about measurements of data in the oceans. And in the train the trainers, I learned wonderful metaphors about machine learning. We need all of that in order to really solve this issue that I showed you earlier. Thank you so much, everybody. Hello, everyone. I'm Yung Chen Xu, a first year PhD student working with Pierre. And today I'll be introducing the low cloud turbulence project. Sorry. Uh, so why we are going to uh, study low cloud? Uh, low level clouds, for example, the shallow cumulus cloud and fragile cumulus cloud are one of the main, uh, main sources of uncertainty in our climate projections. Um, these clouds pool the underlying surface by reflecting more sunlight. Uh, in future climate uh, climate projections, if they reflect more sunlight, for example, we have a larger cloud cover, and the future warming will be like reduced. If we have like uh, if they reflect like less sunlight, the future warming will be amplified. 
uh, in current climate uh, climate projections, the predict uh, the predicted result of the low cloud response is pretty diverse. Like and also they have a very different like very large magnitude of uh, divergence. Um, the uh, the fundamental challenge behind this uncertainty is we cannot uh, accurately represent the turbulence with uh, to generate the low cloud. Uh, current climate model always run on a resolution of, of uh, hundreds of kilometers in horizontal and hundreds of meters in vertical. Um, this is much too coarse to solve the, uh, the turbulence with a, a resolution of like 10 to 100 meters. Uh, even with the near like cloud, uh, cloud resolving uh, resolution with a few like kilometers, it's still like not capable of resolving this turbulence. So we normally use some uh, physical like uh, motivated time transition to relate those small scale processes to our large scale dynamics uh, resolved by the climbing model. Uh, so. In this project, we're going to use some uh, high resolution simulations and machine learning to build an, an, a better prime transition for the low cloud turbulence and to understand the physical mechanisms behind this. Uh, for the high resolution simulations, we're going to use large eddy simulation, which is aimed to resolve the, most of the energy containing eddies, like large eddies or the turbulence of interest. Uh, so we can examine the turbulence in greater details and we use the uh, high resolution simulation to generate data for our machine learning tasks. Uh, for machine learning, the first task is we want to capture the unrepresented or underrepresented uh, turbulence at the function of the result physical states. And we also want to explore and identify some physical mechanisms of the turbulent transport. For our future plans, we wanted to revisit the added diffusivity and mass flags framework, uh, it assumes the total flux can be like splitted into two parts, one from a local eddy and one from a, like a non-local larger thermals. And, uh, but theoretically, uh, the, the, the partition, uh, the theoretical, the theories to like, to, to contribute to the different two terms, like is not uh, available. And also some basic assumptions is, is hard to value. Uh, so we mainly working uh, to improve this kind of uh, transition. We will run a large edit simulation uh, to model an idealized turbulence pace, which is smoke cloud with some radius pooling across a range of low clouds and boundary conditions on a relatively fine grid. Uh, for machine learning, uh, some machine learning uh, deep learning methods with low dimensional representation would be ideal. So uh, because we want to identify some of the uh, physical mechanisms behind, and also we want to use operator learning, for example, neural operators, we are interested in its uh, resolution invariant property. And in both cases, physical constraints is very important. And okay, we can discuss this in our poster session. Thank you. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, it's been quite a few talks. So this project, I think, is not even a level one project. I would call it a level zero. Uh, it's literally even less than a proof of concept. So the idea is basically trying to almost reinvent the way we represent the exchange of properties between the ocean and atmosphere. So just a little bit of a cartoon for people to kind of understand what I'm talking about when I'm, I'm saying the exchange of properties between the ocean and atmosphere. So, okay, ocean, atmosphere, two big components of the climate system. So how do they exchange property? Well, we've been hearing about clouds and precipitation, right? So why we have cloud and precip is because actually we have a planet where 70% of the planet is covered by the ocean, all right? So you have a lot of evaporation. So you exchange property from the ocean into the atmosphere. That's why we have cloud, that's why it rains, that's why there is moisture. Another way where we can think about uh, exchange between the two is heat, for example. Right, so Robert was talking about radiation. Incoming solar radiation, right? So some of it is being reflected back. So that's what Robert was talking about. Now, of course, we have a cover of clouds. That is basically a way to think about greenhouse effect. Some of the energy that is being reflected back and emitted by 
the planet, some of that is being trapped. And that's how the temperature goes up. So now if we put CO2 into the atmosphere, greenhouse gases goes up, temperature of the atmosphere goes up, but the ocean actually is a big portion of how that heat gets absorbed. Most of 90% of the excess energy that we have in the system actually ends up in the ocean. So the temperature of the atmosphere will be a, hot, a, a lot hotter and a lot larger if there was no ocean. So that's another way where there is exchange of property between the atmosphere and the ocean. A lot of the heat actually ends up in the ocean rather than in the atmosphere. So now how that exchange plays out? Well, if we are looking at different estimates of how much, you know, how much energy there is across the surface of the planet, the climate change signal is supposed to be one watt per meter square compared to a thousand, which is the incoming solar radiation, just ballpark, tiny perturbation. So now let's look at some estimates. Those are different products that estimates uh, the amount of heat at the surface of the planet. So again, technically over the historical period, one watt per meter squared is what you expect. The estimate gives us between minus 20 to all, about 30. So this isn't good, right? Uh, it's a big range of uncertainty. They don't even agree on the size. So now, of course, it's not a complaint about those products. This is a hard problem. And why it's hard? Two big reasons. First one, data. So here, we're not in a big data regime. We're in the tiny, tiny data regime. So we basically have a few places where we have either mooring that actually directly calculate this exchange at the boundary, or sometimes we have ships, but they go around once and then they take some measurements. And so that's it. You assume that all those color points here will actually apply to the entire planet. So this is a big problem, right? So very little data, and you're trying to actually map out the entire planet over a few points. So rather than look at correlation, which Pierre mentioned earlier in his talk, right, which is what a lot of people do, and it's because this is all we have, just a few data points, we look at the true fluxes, and then we try to find a relationship with other variables. So what we're trying to do here is to use causal inference to actually try to, rather than look at correlation, trying to look at true relationship between variables. So this is one, problem that we're trying to fix with machine learning in this low data regime. And the other one is to find better relationships. So, so far, in addition to those correlation, people come up with an equation. That's we, the way we express relationship you know, in physics. So here, what we're trying to do is rediscover those relationships, again, based on those few data points, but also based on the global set of data from satellite and so on and so forth. So again, as I said, it's really a level zero. We're trying to basically scratch everything we know and start from the beginning. So, you know, discussion in point, I think it's always good to have a benchmark, right? I'm, I'm only one person. And so we need a lot of people to actually think about this problem. It's very important. And so you need also good benchmark. What are you comparing against? And if you want to do better, then you should bet. Lots of people, lots of collaborators here and elsewhere. We're still trying to hire. So if anybody here is interested in you know, working on that, you know, reach out. Or if you know anybody who's interested, uh, it could be fun. It's a little crazy, but uh, I mean, what is not? Thanks. Okay, so um, so I, I have been introduced a few times, so I don't, I don't feel I need to introduce myself. But again, I'm a statistician and I'm a applied statistician. I enjoy working with uh, applying scientists in applying statistics in, in important scientific research. So my project is uh, uh, for using such tools to understand the function outcomes. And function outcome means uh, spatial data, time series, anything that is not cannot be thought of as just a simple vector. And you actually care about the outcome as a function rather as a collection of numbers. Um, so my, my uh, motivation for this project came from my collaboration with Maria Urati from the E3B department at Columbia, and she studies uh, tropical, rain, uh, tropical rainforest and then the tropical storms impact on this rainforest. So it started by looking at the area images of, um, of uh, the forest and try to understand how the tree species distributed in the forest as a result of, uh, of a historical storms over the, over the decades. And then uh, the traditional approach, and we talk about this during breakfast, is the traditional approach is involve human going to the going to a lot and study the tree species one tree at a time and try to capture uh, the distributions. And but currently, because of the avail available remote sensing technology, you should be able to gauge uh, the distribution of such data at scale. 
And so our, um, after we were able to uh, delineate the tree species from these images, then the next stage we were uh, studying is trying to see whether, uh, whether the distribution of the trees, the density of palm trees as a biomarker of tropical uh, storm impacts correlate with uh, important variables that, uh, that associate with a storm impact. That's when we realized that the traditional regressional method by only looking at the mean of the distribution is not adequate because the curve you see on the screen uh, represent different quantile of the, of the palm tree uh, density. And then you can see that the association between different quantile with the input are different. So the mean is the, the black line and then the color lines are different quantiles and you can see that sometimes the, the, the forcing variables are not affecting the mean, but affecting the tail behavior of distribution. That's when we decided to switch to a study this as a functional outcome and then propose to use the Wasserstein distance as a natural uh, metric. However, Wasserstein metric, no matter uh, how great property mathematically, um, is not known to be easy to optimize over for machine learning. So, so in one of my uh, current project, we are developing algorithms that uh, solve the computational issue in the core of the, a, a, of the flow uh, of the, of the uh, algorithm. So, so it's a little bit hard to read, but here in the center of it, we are proposing to uh, solve the, uh, the backpropagation problem for Wasserstein distance optimization into a machine learning framework. And, and then we're hoping to uh, embed our uh, development here in statistics uh, to uh, other um, structures. One, the two things we're currently considered, one is mask autoencoder, the other is graph neural network as two uh, ways. So our, um, and then this is from our current simple machine learning task to study a temporary distribution and how the functional outcome uh, behave, uh, behave differently given different input. And what we're seeing is that the marginal impact of CO2 solar index of volcano activities on the annual temperature distributions. And, and then we are modeling using a, a mixed uh, Gaussian mixture. And then we can see that the CO2 drive the move. And then where you see the, the solar drive only slightly on the tails. So um, I'm, this is my last slide on future plans. Then we are currently, my postdoc and my doctor students are looking into the graph neural network and the uh, transfer learning using mask autoencoders. Um, hello, everyone. It's been so delightful to, to be here and to learn more about your projects in more detail. It's really helpful for, for us from a KT perspective. Um, just for some context, the KT team is, we're diligently taking notes, trying to digest what it is that you're saying. We're capturing what feels clear. We're capturing what doesn't feel clear because we're also trying to understand what translates to a broader audience or how we may communicate pieces of your work to different stakeholders. So we'll be joining your sessions over the course of the two days as well and trying to digest and find convergence across those points and then get some insight about um, knowledge transfer. So I'll give an overview of KT. Um, Catherine will come up and talk more about how to specifically get involved as well as opportunities for us to support you in your science communication journey. Um, and then Vanessa Rabano will come up and give us uh, an overview of the corporate engagement component specifically. And then we're so thankful that one of our community partners, our future science there in the back there, uh, will be joining us to talk about uh, their amazing work with, with young people who are interested in science and social justice. So as you hopefully are picking up from these different presentations, there's a lot of overlap between education, DEI, and knowledge transfer, we don't see those things as being siloed. We see them as being mutually uh, supportive uh, and deeply related to each other. But I'll emphasize specifically what we're covering on the knowledge transfer piece. Uh, this team was already introduced, uh, but really we represent a combination of skill sets and areas of expertise related to communication, psychology, social work, business strategy, and journalism. I wanted to, to highlight one of our team members, Andy Revkin, who introduced uh, himself at, at dinner last night. 
um, who has a multi-decade career in environmental journalism, working with the New York Times, National Geographic, et cetera. So this is one example of, of a member of our team who has been deeply invested in effective communication as it relates to the environment. So we're trying to bring a range of social science and practical skills to bear on LEAP work and how we translate and engage uh, various stakeholders. So our futurist science team, they will introduce themselves later, are Aaron Mertz and Garanj Choco, um, and they'll uh, present to you in just a moment. So we're really interested in how we ensure meaningful development, use, and application of LEAF science to address the evolving climate adaptation needs of society. This engagement will clearly evolve over the course of uh, the, the projects that are developed here at LEAP. So how we're engaging that now will look very different in year two than in say year five, when we're in a different phase of um, understanding some of your models and how they might be applied. Uh, but it's important for us all to be thinking about this and engaging this from very early on in the process and to not wait until we have say uh, clear findings to start thinking about knowledge transfer. So when we're thinking about reliable projections and how they support adaptation, we're really thinking about uh, how this affects every aspect of society. So when we start thinking about who our key stakeholders might be, we might think about all of these different boxes, right? We're thinking about global conflicts, agriculture, laws, policies, urban planning. Lots of people could benefit from the, the improvement and projections that you all are working on. And part of our goal is to work with how do we take, again, that science and translate it to as many people as possible. Uh, the scientific discoveries of LEAP may force and help us to completely reimagine fundamental features of society. So we want to keep that in mind right now. Again, we don't want to wait until year five to find some wonderful discovery and then start engaging, say, government entities and trying to understand how they might use or benefit from this data. We also, again, to the bi-directional piece of this, don't only want to think about putting information and knowledge out, we also understand that those communities, those stakeholders have knowledge, expertise, et cetera, that's important for your science as well. There needs to be a bi-directional relationship in terms of um, how their knowledge and information may help benefit your, your work early on. So I really like this quote that talks about, you know, there are those who solve the problems of their disciplines and those who solve the problems of the world. And people here at LEAP are interested in that bigger bucket at the end, right? We're trying to solve some really big, complicated problems. We're not just stopping at the scientific output. We want it to be translated in a way that's useful to society more broadly, which means this is an all hands on deck problem, right? So LEAP is trying to integrate knowledge and expertise, not only across academic disciplines um, as related to climate science and climate data science, but also from social sciences, also from community partners and other stakeholders, uh, because all of that knowledge is necessary to make the most use out of the science that we produce here at LEAP. So we're taking this, again, I talked about this bi-directional relationship. So just to put a finer point on some points that Pierre raised in the introductory comments, what are some of the key elements of transdisciplinarity? One is humility. It's that your single discipline is not the thing that's going to help us by itself. Again, we need this integration of knowledge and expertise in order to be most effective in social impact. Um, it's really thinking about integration into a new whole. So, so when we're thinking about transdisciplinarity, we're thinking about groups of people who are not only relying on your bit of expertise and your bit of expertise, we're really trying to identify a problem together from the very beginning and work on every aspect of that problem in terms of the research and trying to solve um, the issues raised by the problem that we identified uh, so that each of those disciplines are working together to create meaningful work. So you can think of it as uh, if those people weren't sitting at the same table, we wouldn't have identified that problem and we wouldn't have identified that particular solution. So it's more integrative than say an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach. Uh, and transdisciplinary work is really thinking about ways we can transform problem identification methods and uh, not salutation, solutions. So what do we mean by engagement? Lots of different ways in which that's happening, community engagement, participating in climate week events, engaging with the United Nations, the World Economic Forum. So again, key stakeholders who are thinking about climate adaptation and climate mitigation, 
Uh, we are working on community and corporate relationship building, um, as well as curriculum development, storytelling, and translation. We're also engaged in uh, public discourse. There are a lot of people who are interested in thinking about climate projection, et cetera, thinking about climate adaptation. So uh, engaging platforms like Andy Sustain What podcast to bring together, again, key stakeholders to be in conversation um, in meaningful ways with each other. Uh, we, this was also highlighted, but working with uh, the Leap Pangeo platform and Carbon Plan to think about user uh, interface and user experiences. So if we want a broad group of people to engage the Leap Pangeo uh, resources, we need to know, one, what types of data do they need? What types of data are they already using? Uh, what types of questions are they asking? Uh, do they understand how to use the platform? If we uh, set the platform up in a slightly different way, might they may, may it, might it be more accessible to them, more useful to them, et cetera? So again, it's it's important to engage those stakeholders early in the process uh, so that we can make the changes necessary um, as we go through development. Um, and then we're thinking about internal support and education. So how do we support you all when you're attempting to engage uh, a broader audience related to your work or you're attempting to communicate across disciplines? How might we support your ability to do that? So we might think about the KT team in some ways as translators, both across uh, disciplines and the work that's happening within LEAP as well as between external stakeholders uh, in the relationship with LEAP. And this will evolve over time, as I've said. So some of the key stakeholders that we're engaging are nonprofits, private industry, government educators, and youth and emerging scientists. We're interested in how they're thinking about and engaging climate adaptation, what data they use and need, their perspectives on important empirical questions, uh, how do we effectively communicate LEAP and LEAP science, um, as well as many, many more uh, questions. So again, thinking about the ways that we're supporting convergence within LEAP, uh, supporting internal and external communication. So uh, a, a couple of you engaged with us prior to this meeting to get support around your talks and how might you frame it. So for smart laypersons who aren't climate scientists, how can you help us more clearly understand what it is that you're trying to say? If you make it make sense to us, you might make it make sense to a broader group of people. So using our feedback to help support you through those processes um, and helping to connect the dots across leap science. So again, can we be useful in stepping back and looking at the 10,000 foot view of each of your different pieces and how they're all related? So for instance, I'm taking notes as you're all presenting. I then went and looked at your posters to try and fill in some details. And on day two, uh, the KT team will come together and start to connect our notes together to start to see how those puzzle pieces might all be working together. We'll then engage you to help us fill in some of the gaps that we're seeing. So the benefit of having us is that we aren't in the technical details of what you're doing, but we can pull out those big pieces and start to see how the dots are connecting, um, especially with engagement with you as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine. Hi everyone, I'm Catherine, I'm the Manager of Communications and Knowledge Transfer for LEAP. And as Courtney was saying, there are all these pieces that are coming together and I'm learning uh, as a non-Earth scientist, I'm learning so much from you. Uh, I mean, I've been, but then especially this morning, and I'm looking forward to the next day and a half. Um, I'm really coming to appreciate even more deeply the stories that are in your research. So for example, last week, Courtney and I um, had the wonderful opportunity to sit with Johnny and we he gave us his ice sheet sliding presentation. And what I quickly came to understand was that as he's giving his presentation to us, um, he's not just telling us earth science research. I don't have to know the research. I came to see it as a story about earth and climate. And it's a story that can be told to many, if not all people who need to hear it um, and then take action because of it. Our LEAP community is filled with, can I say, beautiful stories like ice sheet sliding. Um, and our KT efforts will help you share these stories with as many people as we can reach, corporate partners, community partners, educators, parents, children, um, youth, people who are on different front lines. 
So in the first part of our year two coming up alone, would you please keep in mind some of the ways that our community can remain active in KT activities? So for example, our new partnership with our Future is Science, you will hear awesome things from them very shortly. We'll have You will have the opportunity to pour into, to learn from, and to engage with youth and young adults who are already deep into scientific innovation, and they want to journey along with us. So let's take advantage of that. Um, we have the Climate Science and Investment Conference at the Business School coming up in April. This is an opportunity not only to showcase LEAP, but also LEAP Pangeo. We'll have people play around with it. Um, there will be a corporate audience, and they want to collaborate on climate issues. We'll be able to meet with community partners that afternoon, we hope, as well, and we're putting that together. We're looking into a connection with youth at the center at Teachers College. This will be a wonderful way for you to help us equip and, again, learn from those who are on a different front line of the climate crisis. Um, and as Courtney mentioned, we will have uh, ongoing communications workshops. A few of you took advantage of those last week. And this is a space for you all to hone your presentations and to make sure that knowledge transfer occurs in the most clear and accessible way. That's one of our core values as a center. So our KT team is here to maximize your chapter of the LEAP story, um, help you share it with all of these folks mentioned and really pursue um, the fulfillment of LEAP's commitment to bi-directional dialogue, broad engagement, and open accessibility to all of your work. Great, hello everybody, I'm Vanessa Burbano. Very excited to get to see all of you um, and give you just a little bit of an update on sort of how we at LEAP think about corporate engagement, what we've been doing so far, and what we have planned going forward. So, you know, as Courtney mentioned, and as uh, Pierre mentioned in the introduction, you know, we recognize that if we want the work, the great work that you are all doing to sort of have impact, part of that has to do with sort of realizing that it has, it has to be relevant to and usable to a broad stakeholder group, including the private sector and sort of the range of corporate private entities that are out there. So this, this corporate engagement is a big part of this kind of bi-directional knowledge transfer that, that we've been talking about throughout our day today. And one of the things that we recognized is that when we think about the range of corporate audiences out there, and just think of the various different entities and, and uh, private sector sort of entities that you might think about, they're really going to vary in sort of what they might get out of LEAP and what type of information and what format of information is likely to be most useful to them. Um, so if you think about that, that's going to range from some companies are going to be really excited about a lot of the sort of raw data that we're making available, just sort of the raw data that a lot of you are, are generating. Um, some are going to want access to sort of, let's, let's aggregate this data in kind of an executive user-friendly type of format, and that might be the format that's, that's most relevant to some. Um, some may just want like really high level sort of storytelling executive summaries of, of some of the, the research that's been done, done by LEAP. Um, and others are going to be interested in sort of understanding, you know, how their own communications and initiatives can be improved um, for greater impact amongst their own stakeholders. So for this last piece and sort of on, on the research informed communication side, um, there's also a research element to, to the corporate engagement piece. Uh, Florencio later on will be talking about some of the research that we're doing. Um, we're interested in understanding how different kind of framing and communication is likely to have greater impact on corporations themselves and make them more likely to think that climate change matters and they need to do something about it as well as helping them understand how their framing about their initiatives can better be received by and influence their groups of stakeholders, all towards sort of this aim um, of moving, moving what we care about forward. So we are really interested in, 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 as I mentioned, trying to reach a kind of broad range of corporate partners and stakeholders out there. Uh, when we think about the different sort of tools that we might make available via LEAP for them. Uh, this has led us to realize that there's, you know, these, these, these needs are going to vary very likely by different corporate audience segments. And so when we came up with our inaugural, our sort of first list of corporate partners at the start of LEAP, uh, you can see that our list of partners was sort of designed to be representative of what we expected to vary in terms of the types of data, the types of ways that these different entities would want to engage with LEAP. 
So this was our inaugural set of corporate partners. You can see the, the, the companies that are uh, involved with us right now. Um, we have to date been very sort of purposefully um, uh, sort of cautious or slow in our kind of uptake of new corporate partners because we wanted to get to a point where there's there's a, a portal to share, there's sort of a data infrastructure to, to share so that when we engage with these new corporate partners, we're, to, we're sort of at a period where they're gonna be excited about getting on board and sort of be thinking about what, what they can do with us in the future. Um, so that's where we are at now. And so when what we're thinking about doing, you know, what's our overall process for engagement? Uh, we are soliciting input from our partner companies and a broader set of companies on what is the kind of leap data and the format of this data, nature of the outputs that would be relevant to you. We're then going to take that information and sort of bring it back to all of you so that you have a sense of sort of the types of uh, data and formats that, that these types of entities would find useful. And we're also, you know, thinking about um, for certain corporate partners that might be interested in sort of the specifics of some of the research projects that you're engaged in, ways that we can sort of facilitate, uh, facilitate engagement in that way as well as for you students and postdocs out there, thinking about ways that we can leverage our corporate partners for internship opportunities, future job positions, et cetera, and sort of help you make those types of connections as well. So we're in the, the, the process now, as I mentioned, of exploring collaborations with some new partners. These are some of the entities that we sort of ha have had more in-depth discuss discussions with to date. Uh, we're in the process of sort of developing a membership plan uh, to think about how we're going to sort of engage with corporations in the future. This has to do with partly thinking about, you know, if we think about the long-term sustainability of LEAP, maybe past the point of NSF grant funding and things like that, we're hoping that there will be enough engagement and excitement from the corporate sector um, that this could be sort of a, a, a self-funded enterprise essentially for the future as well. So one thing to, to highlight that we have upcoming in 2023 as Catherine mentioned, we're going to have a business and climate uh, conference in collaboration with the Columbia Business School Tamer, Tamer Center. Uh, the most likely date for this is going to be April 28th. Uh, this will be an opportunity for us to showcase the Pangeo, showcase the, uh, the, the essentially what Carbon Plan is going to be sharing with us later, gather information from the various representatives of this conference in terms of how they're reacting to this a portal that we'll be presenting and what other type of information that they, they may, may find necessary, um, as well as sort of tee up the potential future ways that companies can engage with LEAP, including on the research side, research engagement and collaboration, future funding opportunities, as well as internships um, and future job placement opportunities. So my ask of you for now is mark your calendar for, H for April 28th. You'll hear more from us about ways that you can get involved with that. Um, and this is the time that we're excited to bring in new corporate engagement. So any of you who have contacts at or have an idea of a company that you think would be excited to get involved with LEAP, please reach out to me and I'm happy to talk to you more about that. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Aaron Mertz. And I am Garance Choco. And I'm at the Aspen Institute, which is a global nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., with a broad mission to help realize a free, just, and equitable society. I've been there for almost four years after I completed my postdoc at Rockefeller University, and I'm the director of the Science and Society Program with the mission to advance science for the public good. And I am the CEO and founder of CODA Society. Coda Society is a firm that has been helping countries and regions to help to sync and rebuild social and physical infrastructures, always with equity and social impact in mind. For example, we've helped to sync national health care system, we've helped to sync public administration system, we help to sync the economic development of some regions, and we help develop think tank and policy institutes for our head of states. We met about three years ago at a social professional group called After Arts, which is for people who had an early career in classical music or a significant interest in classical music. I'm an amateur cellist, and Garance is a very accomplished pianist. And we started just trading ideas of what we could do with our different organizations' expertise. And we came up with an idea to unite two tremendous societal forces, youth, youth activism around the world, 
um, that was largely rooted in science, things like climate change, water mismanagement, infectious diseases, and also from um, two summers ago, the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, which called for um, equity across different fields. So we thought, why don't we try to apply that to science? And we wanted to channel those forces into making science more societally responsive to community needs. So after a year of conceptualization, we received a seed grant from the Amgen Foundation and another, sorry, from Genentech and then another from the Manitou Fund. And we've later received support from the Amgen Foundation, Samuel A. Foundation, 3M, the Rita Allen Foundation, and Lida Hill Philanthropies. And our future was sci is science was born. Mm -hmm. And Garantz will tell you about our goals here. So our goal was to really promote like exponential social impact, all right? And so our three objectives throughout the program and also in the design of the program is to diversify the field of science. So everyone knows here that there are very high barriers of entry for, to like enter the scientific field, especially for low-income and BIPOC students. So from an ethical perspective, being able to like promote and accelerate access to these communities in the field of science is sound. At the same time, given the complexity that society is facing and that science needs to address, bringing more diversity, bringing more diverse voices into the field of science, promote more innovation and more problem-solving ability. The second aspect, the second, one of our second goal is to really look at science as a tool to solve for social justice issues. For example, if, like the failure of infrastructures, right, as a scientific aspect, healthcare disparities as, as a scientific aspect, climate crises, as we all know here, as like um, the social justice implications. So looking at how science can be applied as a tool to solve for this. And also, as you heard, like our passion is for society building and equity. So looking at how can we leverage science, the scientific field, as a tool to bring about more equitable economic outcomes for low income use. Looking at like how can we accelerate the entry of use using a career in science or a career into a science science adjacent field. Now in terms of the design of our program, we took a system thinking approach. So we decided to focus on high school students and graduate students. Why high school students? Obviously, they're great and adorable, but <laughs> they have the ability to change their behaviors, right? They are at an age where they can evolve where their brain is receptive to new information. Also, high school students live are the anchor of a community. If you see a behavior change in a high school student, specifically now today's a Gen Z, you will see how like their change will change their family. And also like the way in which their way of thinking evolves is gonna impact their peers at school. And also they're the biggest consumer category. So a changing behavior in high schoolers is going to maybe push corporation to like create products that are more adapted to the need of these high school students. We also decided to pair them, and we'll talk more about it later, with graduate students. I'll we'll talk more about the design later. We also want to focus on the roots, the root cause of inequity. So we are like, you know, there are many root causes of inequity. I know that this is like also you know, a field and a topic that you at least are like looking at, right? With our future in science, we are inviting our students, that being high schoolers and graduate students, to help us deconstruct what these root causes are and also to find a solution to the root causes of inequity. This is why in our curriculum, we talk about food security and insecurity, structural racism, healthcare disparity, epigenetics. And also, uh, and also policy Finally, um, um, Courtney was talking about transdisciplinary. It's true that it is like a framework and a, a terminology that is very well adapted. We use both disciplinary uh, and also cross-sectoral. Science is integral to many different fields and many different sectors. 
And in the way in which we design our curriculum, we will show it to you like what are the different fields that we are like um, touching. Lastly, um, in order to ensure like participation, in order to lower barriers of entry, we decided to like provide funding to all the participants of our initiative. So high schoolers are given money to participate, right? Because they're often coming, they are coming from like low income um, background and communities, as well as for our graduate students who are, you know, providing their time. And so we are like paying them as well. And as you mentioned, there's a significant um, diversity, equity, and inclusion element to this work. Um, the scientific workforce has long lacked diversity, which in turn discourages Black and other people of color from pursuing scientific careers. These causes can be um, a dearth of mentors and role models, preconceived notions that science is exclusive to white males, and subpar ed uh, STEM education. So across race, gender, class, ability, and all other dimensions that inform someone's identity, from the familial to the global level, what you see really impacts what you think you can become. As Marianne Wright Edelman once very eloquently said, you can't be what you can't see. And it's a truth that has even more resonance if you know that by 2045, the US is projected to be majority non-white. So as Zina Abdul Karim, a youth change, youth climate change organizer working with Zero Hour explains, quote, minority communities are exposed to what the privileged and the people in power are not. Therefore, these communities know the right steps to take in the change we need for the kickstart of true social and environmental justice, unquote. So two black youth, for example, and we've corresponded with them and they provided some great insights for our work, used the platform of the laboratory while they were in high school to mobilize for change. One of them named L. Lanier Lett, who's now specializing in epidemiology as an MD PhD student in Philadelphia, was prompted by family prevalence of diabetes to research the genetics of pancreatic cells. Dr. Otana Jakpur, she's now an ophthalmology resident in Michigan, was motivated by the pollution in her hometown of Riverside, California, to research the pulmonary effects of indoor air purifiers with findings that influenced California ozone requirements. Both became finalists in the Regeneron talent, Science Talent Search and that propelled them toward careers towards science. And these young scientists demonstrate how people's communities and lived experiences can shape the trajectories of scientific research, which in turn determines what society visions possible for itself. So we have a little video that like showcase, you know, give an overview um, of our program. But before we start, like um, we have like three pillars. We have pillar one, that is an intensive mentorship program in which we're pairing high schoolers and graduate students um, to exchange knowledge and learn. I'll talk more about that. We have pillar two that Aaron will uh, share more about in a little bit, that is a national educational media campaign. And lastly, an ambassador's program. But let's go with um, the video. Pillar one. Okay. I think it's probably the largest role in solving today's most pressing issues. We as a community and as people need to use science effectively, and we need to make sure that science is used ethically and morally. But I think science is the tool that we use to solve them. benefits of having a mentor is someone that can not only guide you, but can inspire you. Um, to me, a mentor is someone who you look up to and someone who is going to push you to your, to your fullest. Yeah, master's student, student, oral restoration genetics. 
learn what skills are important for college. This is taking good notes and start to understand how they can explore their passions and music. You will be much more confident. A big part of research is having the confidence to ask questions and talk to people. And the confidence to make mistakes. We can help them be more successful. That would be hard for to me. In high school, you're learning about DNA, then and understanding strategies that DNA concepts that you're learning about. This, these different concepts are some things that I want to be able to bring life to any specific new DNA. I define activism as using your voice to make a change um, and sort of implied in that in activism, you have to be active and then just wait for problems to arise. You have to actively try to stop problems before they emerge. Um, science is a way to kind of shift the paradigm um, away from, you know, change the status quo, away from what is to what can be and see that possibility real life. We're very proud of our mentors and mentors. There are a few more videos to go to you. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to like dive a bit deeper into Pillar One, the mentorship program. So again, the we were very intentional in terms of the design of the mentorship program. So first of all, we chose a near peer mentorship model. As I explained, we have like our adorable high schoolers, right? And then we pair, they are coming from all over the country. They are low-income students, but they have exceptional abilities. Abil not exceptional from like a GPA perspective, but our recruitment process is very strong. We look at their purpose, their passion, their curiosity. Okay? And then we pair them with mentors who are graduate students in different universities, and their um, concentration is pure science. What we've seen that was interesting is that our high schoolers who are Gen Z are very well versed in social justice, right? And our graduate students are not. So graduate students are being like integrating this knowledge, right? Awakening their curiosity about these social issues while transferring their pure scientific knowledge to our high school students. So it's very nice, you know, a complementarity. Also, our graduate students are at a time in their career where they might decide if they want to like, you know, wear a white coat or if they might want, you know, to like go into entrepreneurship or go and work in corporation. So um, we're gonna show you a video about, you know, how mentors share their knowledge with our mentees. Hi, my name is Rose Leach Basin, and I'm a fourth year PhD student at Kent State University in human evolutionary biology. We've now worked to combat this myth that race is a biological basis by understanding skeletal developmental biology and the processes that affect the development and architecture of bones by studying our closest living relatives, primates. So by doing that, we can begin to combat this notion that race has a biological basis when it in fact does not. And I am a PhD student in material science at the University of California, Los Angeles. I'm generally interested in using predictive models to address problems related to climate change and the mitigation of the effects of climate change. Um, my hope is to create models that can guide decision makers uh, to plan and make choices that lead to better well-being of communities. Currently, my research is on energy systems and their components. Mm -hmm. So here is one of the supercomputers that we use. Uh, we have people working on various important topics and risk analysis from various engineering backgrounds. Uh, some are working on determining and mitigating risk fires caused by utility equipment, biometric prediction. We have people working on pipeline failure prediction and management. These are the new types of resources that I use in my research as well. And I'm excited to see where my research takes me. Hey, my name is Juliana. I'm a geologist at CU Boulder. I study past climate. 
And one of my main research questions is, how did ancient lake basins change in response to globally warm climate in the past? We would expect sediments to be changing over time. So when I'm in the field, I collect samples from all different time points. We can study ancient lakes from the past to better understand how we predict they will change in response to global warming today. Using science and geology to understand how lake ecosystems will respond to climate change will help prepare and get resources to communities dependent on those lake ecosystems. Hello, OFIS members. My name is Hassan Farah. I'm a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech. Our lab focuses primarily on children with cerebral palsy that affects their motor control and motor skills. My job as a researcher is to take the observations that our therapists have made and come up with new questions. How can I observe what we've done and elevate it to another like this and force plates like these? You should see arrows jump up and down. As you can see, the motion capture sensors are from the shoulders all the way down to the toes. The goal here is to create new targets for intervention, create new therapy treatments, and ultimately, we can increase the quality of life. So do not have, do not have <laughs> a few more. Um, Asan actually has been is part of our team now, so it's very nice. So um, we can go. So the curriculum that we design is participatory, meaning that our students and so our high schoolers and graduate students are also part of like designing the curriculum along with us. We have a slide that showcases some of our different modules. So let's where ah here. So you'll see, so our module are like social justice. Obviously, we start with that. The second module is about science and the intersection with social justice. The rest are like very much like science focused, right? So it's health and healthcare, right? Um, genomics and epigenetics, environmental and climate. This is where like also we're like able to partner more like deeper um, in deep. Engineering and artificial intelligence, astrophysics and space exploration, big data and innovation, another area in which we can collaborate with you. We have capstone projects that I'll talk a bit more about in a minute, um, and more capstone projects. <laughs> so, the capstone project, and I have a video for that, it's a bit of a long, I think it's six minutes, yeah. so we might, you know, also have some popcorn, or we can also like get it short. But it's to really position the youth as an like agent of change. Not only are they coming, learning about the curriculum, right? But we want them to, give, to apply their knowledge, to develop projects that are going to have a positive impact in their communities. So it's part of the requirement for them to come up with that, a project that has a measurable impact, right, in their communities. Our purpose is to send the message across to like the residents and even the mayor for the New York City Housing Authority to do better and to care more about um, low income families in the South Bronx, which is our community. We are worthy of being. We're not asking for handouts. We pay rent. We should be able to live in this state. Name is Daniel. While some may look at these two locations and find no connection, I seem to illustrate with this video the underlying issues that contributes to both of these issues mental illness and a lack of treatment options in our, throughout our communities. Individuals with mental illness are forced to choose between the inhumane conditions of communities such as Wood Street or the dangers of the correctional facilities with the Oakland County Jail. We as a community have failed to address the issue of mental health and now are being forced to reckon with the consequences in the form of mass homelessness and incarceration. I, I would advocate for further implementation of rehabilitative services both inside and outside prisons, 
listening, composing, arranging, or playing music can have widespread mental health benefits. That by applying this to the mental health crisis, we can better our communities and see long-lasting benefits from this change. Our project focus is to increase access to quality nutritious food and nutritional information to students from food insecure households at my school. I did this by increasing the awareness between the correlation between diet and brain function. I began with researching how the foods we consume affect how the brain performs. I then compiled what I've learned into this infographic to share with students in my school, and I plan to send it out to community supermarkets, restaurants, food banks, and to spread this essential information. Through this, hopefully we can implement nutritional information into a curriculum and inspire students to eat better foods. I'm also partnering with a teacher at my school and a friend of mine to, um, to student lead an initiative through the Mass Farm to School Conference. The Mass Farm to School Conference is an organization aiming to bring more quality, local source nutrients to school lunches free of cost. My friend and I will be partnering with them to conduct research as using my project. This would not just be within the school. Students would be able to leave school with nutritious, with nutritious food. Healthy food doesn't have to look pricey or complicated. It's possible to integrate it into cafeteria menus. And that's what I will be doing with this Mass to School Farm initiative in spreading information through a chancer cluster um, were dumped into that creek. And even now, there's a lot of people my age who aren't really aware of that. There's also a lack of trust toward public health and medical institutions because of historical racism in public health and medicine. One example is the Tuskegee study. There's partnerships with agencies that work with communities of color can help to increase trust. For example, the San Francisco Department of Public Health partners with Latino Community Foundation. And there needs to be pop-up clinics at different times and days to allow flexibility for parents to bring their children to vaccination sites or convenient locations as to resources for obtaining a COVID-19 vaccine. So I decided to go research and I found out that it's um, all of this was because of um, redlining that happened in the past. As for doctors, listen to all of your patients. They know their bodies better than anyone else. So please check every patient for care. Take care of yourselves and stay hydrated. Hi, my name is Anna Brantia and my project explores the LGBTQ population and their various physical and mental health disparities due to the offense of youth homelessness and stigmatization across communities. In order to curb this crisis, my proposal is a website which briefly overviews for information and spreads awareness. So all this project were initiated, were conceptualized and initiated and implemented by our students. And you see that they're touching many different like societal sector, right? Looking and using science and social science as a tool. So um, we have also like, uh, as part of Pillar One, community talks, right? And we're gonna stand through these. We are being, you know, to be like, again, um, be loyal to our transdisciplinary and disciplinary approach. We bring like speakers um, once a month coming from different sectors. We have like uh, our very own Courtney Cockburn and Pierre Gentil being like one of these speakers last year. We also had people from corporations such as Christopher Green at LinkedIn to help think about professional development, Dr. Adrian Nguyen from Procter and Gamble, Richard Woodward is um, CM. We had young activists. Our scientific activist teenager, which was Deja Taylor, um, who um, is an inventor of infection detection structures um, and a regenerative science fair finalist. So we can go well because, like, we um, the program is participatory, we always like, ask for our participants to share their opinion of the program and give us feedback. Of course, we keep some of the Yes, right. Um, so one of our main teams is saying that arbitrary science is a love and way to people just in science. It's a very nuanced thing. We want to like read whether like yeah, this type of work and the way we address social justice feels like a complete reflection of myself. 
Whether it is with OFIS or CODA Societies or the Aspen Institute, I want to be available and involved as long as I can. And if I didn't have programs like this to make me dive deeper, then I wouldn't know about opportunities. So then we have a second pillar of the program where we try to reach the masses. So pillar one is reaching a few dozen students each year. The first year we had 40 mentors and mentees. This is the second year we have 60. And through this pillar, we're trying to reach as many members of the public as possible through a light touch, high impact initiative operating in media that mean a lot to youth. So social media, specifically TikTok and Instagram. And this offers us exponential reach and knowledge and idea uh, sharing. And what we have is a competition that's open to the public. We have our second iteration of it open right now. So if you are up to the age of 24, or if you have siblings or classmates who are of that age, um, I think it's 14 through 24, please participate. We're looking for about a minute long video that you post on your social media and tag us that answers the question, how can science be used to impact or make a difference in your community? And we have some Winners from the first, oh, actually, this introduces the well, campaign. Okay, Bruce, because we have five minutes. This is only a minute. Okay. Is there anything which is a green? Yep. Hello, I'm Marcia McNutt, president of the National Academy of Sciences. The National Academy is an honorary organization to which a very select group of the top scientists in America are elected each year. We also serve as the official advisors to the nation on any topic for which evidence can inform better public policy. The message I want to convey to you today is that the true skill and creativity in science is all about asking the right questions. The answers to those questions are comparatively easy after a question is well posed. But if the scientists asking those questions only constitute a narrow cross section of communities, backgrounds, and experiences, then science is not going to be answering the problems that most impact Americans. For this reason, we need much greater diversity in our scientific workforce. And now I'd like to invite the youth of America to join the Our Future is Science media campaign. Think about how you would answer the question, how could science make a difference in my community? Share your video with the hashtag, Our Future is Science, for a chance to win prizes and scholarships. Hello. Yes, so just some screenshots, but I'll play the winner from last spring. Hi, my name is Samara and I live in Durham, North Carolina. An existing problem in my community is water contaminated by PFAs, which are perfluorochal polyfluorochal substances. Individuals living in areas dependent on drinking water from the Cape Fear watershed have high rates of cancer due to PFAs being present in the water. So you may be wondering, how did this watershed become contaminated? Well, for more than four decades, a company that was a floral chemical producing plant was dumping PFAs into this watershed, which has led to water continuing to be contaminated. We can solve the contaminated water crisis occurring in the Cape Fear watershed through science by developing treatments that can remove PFAs from drinking water. Two treatments that are currently being studied include perfluoroctanoic acid, PFOA, and perfluoroctane sulfonic acid, PFOS. In both of these treatments, activated carbon is present which absorbs organic compounds has been shown to effectively remove PFAs from water. The different treatments can not only be used in water treatment facilities, but can be placed where water enters an individual's home. Through science, additional treatments can be discovered, which could ultimately ensure that all individuals relying on drinking water from the Cape Fear watershed have access to clean water free from PFAs. How can science make a difference in your community? We're really proud that from the first year of activities, we reached a total of 319,000 people through our media campaigns and through outreach for um, seeking mentors and mentees. And we hope that this coming year is even bigger, especially with LEAP's involvement.
So yes, it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, it's been wonderful to like have this conversation with uh, Courtney and with Catherine, who are part of the new uh, team. And the goal, you know, about partnership is to, of course, expose our students to the field of like climate mitigation, climate protection. In the survey that we did with our students to like see to gauge their interest, climate justice and climate the climate crisis appear as one of their the main issues for them. Um, also, as you know, we cut uh, like to the first half of the session. Being able to like help and collaborate with me to make science a communication of science being accessible to all stakeholders, right? We are also both dedicated to co-shaping and multidisciplinary approaches, knowing that science and you know touches many different fields. Um, and we want to establish like science for social justice as an academic discipline and bring all of our body like a more body of knowledge in order to um to keep on exploring this intersection. So in practice, we are working with LEAP to co-design modules for our curriculum, specifically about climate data science. We have had Pierre and Courtney present community talks. And what's really special about those is it's not just for our 60 mentors and mentees, but we've actually invited our top applicants who are not ultimately selected for the program. We've designated them as scholars. They receive invitations to the community talks and they're also open to the public as well. So they have a very wide audience. And to this, we're trying to further different ways that we're communicating science to various stakeholder audiences. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thanks, Pierre. Um, so everyone can see my title, and uh, this is uh, the gist of this is about um, um, how to best uh, um, come up with the, uh, the the best settings for coefficients or constants in equations and you know, all sets of equations that exist in climate model. So basically, optimizing uh, their performance. Um, and my focus is on the atmosphere. So I think it's been uh, made clear that there are a number of processes that uh, must be represented in the Earth system model. And as it relates to the atmosphere, here's a schematic on the top right. All kinds of clouds. These clouds are different shapes. They have different horizontal extents, different depths. They affect radiation in different ways. They precipitate. They produce uh, rainfall evaporates, and that produces these things called cold poles that are these density currents that affect the next uh, development of clouds. And each of these, uh, in, in bulk and each individual cloud type, has a series of equations okay, that, that, that sort of correspond to their, the processes that go on with these clouds. And each equation has many parameters. And so um, some things uh, are known, like, for instance, the Coriolis parameter relates to the rotation of Earth. Uh, when things fall in the atmosphere, gravitational constant, that's a, a, a parameter that, that is well known, but many parameters are not. So in these equations, a lot of, a lot of coefficients or constants are not well known. And we want to figure out, uh, use, use machine learning to um, set as many of those unknown parameters as we can um, so that we can improve uh, climate model skill and, and hopefully get better climate projections. Um, and so here's, here's some of the methods we're, we're using, um, that we envision using and, and, and have used thus far. Um, so in the schematic to the left, you can imagine um, this is really a, a multidimensional, you know, we have a lot of parameters in a model that we must determine the settings for. But just pretend in this case there are two. So you have um, this here. Oops. Oh, it was, was off. So two parameters, um, and you can increase one, increase the other. And as you change the, the, the settings for these, and you measure the performance. So you, you run the model with these different parameter settings. You can see the climate, you can measure the performance of the climate model for those different parameter settings. And the performance is a function of these parameter combinations. And here, for instance, you know, down here where you have this, this combination, you have better performance. Over here, you have better. Um, and so we want to find all of those spots in this complicated state space on where you have the best performance of your model. Now we can't run infinite numbers of samples to get all of the uh, combinations. So what we do is we run a few limited numbers of samples where these little asterisks are, and then we uh, design a surrogate model to kind of fit the state space. And we want to then use that surrogate model to find all of these little hot spots or, or these, well, they're, they're blue, but these little spots where the, the, the model is performing well. And again, this is just for two parameters, but we really have many parameters. And so this is just an example of us doing that. 
Okay, and we're looking at um, certain combinations. It could be, say, you know, these spots here in this state space. And this is us comparing the model output for uh, the amount of liquid in clouds and the amount. So this is a radiation metric. So this relates to uh, infrared radiation um, and cloud, uh, the cloud impact on that. And so if we have these observational metrics that say, oh, well, this is where the, the uh, how much liquid should be in a cloud. This is where radiation should fall. We want our methodology to give us all of the parameter combinations, okay, in the state space that agree with those metrics. So sort of a crosshairs right here. And we have these two lines because that represents some sort of uncertainty um, that we built into the, the, the algorithm. So this, these, these black spots are all just, um, the black dots are all random guesses. And you see, if we were just to randomly guess, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't match things so well. But when we use machine learning to target these sort of hot, these sort of good spots, we can, we can uh, arrive at a correct answer. Here is another case for, for different output diagnostics. This relates to the amount of light rain over, over a, a grid box. Okay, same, same um, radiation diagnostic on the x-axis. Here is where the observations say we should fall, but you see we can't match it. So in other words, we learn not from this method, not just if we can match certain, uh, certain diagnostics or outputs, we learn where we can't. And this tells us that our problem might not just be about optimizing the coefficients in equations, we might need new equations. Okay, so new parameterization for some process. So here's an example of um, the, the, the emulator um, and how well it's performing at present. You see, ideally, if the emulator is a faithful representation of the Earth system model, it will um, fall along this one-to-one -one line. You see sometimes for some parameters, um, say this is the amount of ice in clouds, you see it doesn't agree with the model, uh, with the actual model that well. And so some of our future plans are to develop a better emulator. So this whole process of parameter estimation and calibration is, in, is improved. And that brings me to my final slide on how do we best sample um, uh, across all of these parameters so that we can use all, uh, a strategic, so we have a strategic way of sampling so we can get a, a, good, um, a good emulator that can uh, faithfully represent all the, the whole parameter state space. How best do we quantify model skill? So uh, that was, I was just showing a schematic on, on model skill. We want to, minute, we want to uh, maximize that, but how you compute ESM skill is subjective to some extent. Um, and then how do we uh, incorporate observational and, and um, emulator skill into um, their uncertainty into this whole process? And, uh, and that's basically uh, where we're at right now. We'd love to discuss some of these uh, points a bit further. Um, thanks. Frank, yeah. Measure the correlation or um, like, you said if the emulator was perfect, then it has like the highest like watch. Uh, you mean right here, what are we measuring right here? Yeah. Oh, so what we're, so what we're, what we're measuring is the amount of ice in a cloud for this yeah. particular example. Okay, so you go and you will go in a cloud, you, you look at all the clouds in a particular model grid box, and you just basically sum up all of the ice from the, from the cloud base to the cloud top in, in that particular grid box. And so if we have observations of that, which to some extent we do, uh, but they're uncertain, we want to then modify or optimize all those parameter combinations to, to try to get that estimate of ice correct in the model. It makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. It's nice to follow up on Greg's presentation. He introduced our question and our problems well. Uh, my name is Linnea Hawkins. I'm a postdoc at Columbia. Um, and I'm thinking about similar problems of how do we develop tools and methods for systematically calibrating um, Earth system models. And we're specifically focusing on the land surface component. And this work is done in collaboration with T Katie Dagan, Daniel Kennedy, Dave Lawrence at NCAR, as well as Pierre. Uh, so some of the motivation uh, Greg introduced, you know, why we want to use machine learning to help calibrate our system models. Um, we're focused on the land surface. It's an integral part of the climate system as a whole. And as we think about wanting to constrain our future climate projections, um, one of the large uncertainties is how much atmospheric CO2 the land surface will remove from the atmosphere in the future, how strong that land surface carbon sink might be. Um, 
down the road. So if we can better constrain the parameters in the land surface component, we may be able to better constrain our uncertainty in climate projections. Um, but one of the other objectives of, of LEAP broadly and of our project as well is um, when we think about translating climate projections from changes in precipitation to actual impacts or risks or vulnerabilities that are facing society, um, the land model can be really a key tool. We might look at projections of precipitation, but need to, to bridge that into a measure of water availability to a community in the future. Um, so these land models are commonly used in, in actionable science applications. And so one of the barriers to them being used is uh, easy, fast calibration methods. So that's uh, another objective of our work. Um, and as we've heard throughout the day, you know, these models have lots of processes that need to be represented at the grid scale level and thus have many parameters. So our objective is to develop these open source tools and methods uh, for systematic model calibration. This is somewhat of a diagram of what our method methodology might look like. Uh, first, we generate a large ensemble of model simulations where we've slightly perturbed those individual parameters. Then we uh, develop metrics that can be used to evaluate model performance, use machine learning tools to uh, generate surrogate models or emulation as, as Greg was just um, showing us earlier, um, and then use those emulators to and well as these metrics and ensembles to constrain a plausible parameter space. We may need to repeat this cycle many times until we can uh, have a robust estimates of our parameter distributions, and then ultimately optimize uh, the model for specific questions or applications. Some early uh, preliminary results, just to get a sense of where we're at in this process, we've identified the parameters in the model that we're most interested in and set ranges for those parameter values. We've then run a large ensemble um, of model simulations with slight perturbations to those parameter values and then used that ensemble as well as some different machine learning emulators to quantify the sensitivity of those parameters, how influential are those perturbations in the parameters to a process we're most interested in. Um, and so these are just some results. We've been focusing on global leaf area index, so global canopy cover, um, and we're finding that parameters related to photosynthesis are most influential, um, particularly on needle leaf trees, broadleaf trees, or different grasses. But we're also seeing influence of parameters related to plant hydraulics or respiration, for example, as being influential as well. So the next directions we're going to be moving in is to develop more evaluation metrics uh, to better constrain these processes, um, explore different optimization methods. Um, that's something I'm interested in engaging with this community specifically about um, ultimately evaluate those parameter sets and then test it across applications. To end on a couple of discussion points, um, we're finding that the selection of evaluation metrics is going to be really key to constraining specific processes in the model. So I'm looking forward to the discussions in our uh, metrics focus group. Um, and then I just want to also highlight that these methodologies we're developing are going to be transferable across different model components. So while we're focusing on the land surface component, these methods should be adaptable to the atmosphere or ocean or polar um, components of the models as well. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jerry. I'm a third year PhD candidate at UC Irvine studying personal science. And today I'll be talking to you about two paths towards more principal new and organizations of climate models. So um, why should we even use machine learning and climate models in the first place? Well, one big reason is computational complexity. You see, uh, some of the most important or some processes happen at scales smaller than model grid resolution. And a good example of that is clouds. Clouds uh, transport heat and moisture, produce rain, and can amplify or dampen warming based on their size and position in the atmosphere and shape. Um, so ideally, we'd have a mini model for clouds of each of these grid cells, something called a cloud welcome model. But as you might have guessed, uh, these CRMs are, uh, are, are way too computationally expensive to run for long-term time simulations. So that's where machine learning comes to play. We can use uh, neural network emulators that are trained to reproduce the output of these CRMs at much reduced computational costs. 
However, there's a, a catch. So what's a catch? Um, for one, uh, there are a lot of knobs and dials that you, you, that you use to design these new networks. And the variability in terms of these knobs and dials called hyperparameters are often undersampled. Second, um, new networks, networks can be confidently incorrect. So when they're producing a correct answer or an incorrect answer, they're not going to tell you when uh, more answer is more likely than the other. They're going to give you the answer. And uh, that's a problem because we, we should know when they're extrapolating. So how do we resolve this? Well, for the first uh, problem, the answer is somewhat straightforward. Uh, we can just uh, train and test hundreds of these neural networks online and see what the intrinsic spread is from altering, altering the hyperparameters. And by the benefit of large sample size, we get empirical evidence for whether a core change that's outside of those hyperparameters actually is necessary for improved online performance. The second strategy is a bit more complicated. Um, so for this strategy, we want to uh, have the neural network tell us explicitly when it's uncertain, or just give us a measure of how uncertain it is. And to do this, we modify the cost function and outputs, and that way we can, they can let us know when they're extrapolated. So uh, in terms of results for strategy one, uh, we're starting with a case study using relative humidity versus specific humidity for inputs. And this is a case where uh, that change is not a hyperparameter change. It's a fundamental change to the core architecture because uh, there's no way you can change how deep uh, um, or wide in your network is to change to go from specific to relative humidity. So offline, the results are not that uh, significant. You can see that the performance is the same. And by offline, I mean, uh, testing these neural networks uh, on a fixed validation set uh, that doesn't change. However, the story is very different when you go online. So online um, is when you actually plug in these neural networks into the host clamp system and they're run off their own uh, outputs rather. So once you plug these online, you can see that um, the relative humidity models perform much better in aggregate and the spread is also greatly reduced. For a second strategy, um, we're looking at the uncertainty estimates to, and comparing them to the validation error. So as a quick sanity check, uh, we can look at how the uncertainty compares to the model's own validation error. And as you might expect, um, there's a pretty good relationship. As, as the model is more uncertain, it makes more errors in the validation set. However, what's more surprising is that uh, the uncertainty also matches up quite nicely with the validation error for independently trained control neural networks. Um, so where do you go from here? Well, step one is to combine both strategies of large scale testing, oh, large scale testing and uh, outputting uncertainty to see if that extra cost function and outputs results in worse online performance. Step two is enable the use of more extensive CRM when the uncertainty is high. And you can imagine just replacing um, each of those boxes that are really uncertain with the CRM so you can get the benefits of high efficiency when you don't need it and um, accurate performance when you do. Uh, I'll be real quick, it's about time. So thanks to discuss uh, how we decide what's prioritized in, in terms of principled machine learning. I just went over un uncertainty and spread, but people also care about explainability and simplicity of models. And we don't know if those are mutually exclusive, mutually exclusive or not. And uh, while it's a good, good sign that the uncertainty metric uh, overlaps with the uh, offline validation error for control neural networks, it might tell us that there might be some missing inputs that prevent us from having good uh, performance when there's convection. That's it, thanks for listening. Great. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about a, a project that I'm uh, working on with uh, Taya Heimdahl, Julia Simpson, Jiwen Hao, Tian Zheng, and Matt Long. Everyone except for Matt Long is here at the meeting, and we have a poster outside that I hope you'll talk to all of us uh, about. So our motivation is that the ocean modulates climate change. Uh, well, one of the ways the ocean modulates climate change is by uh, absorbing carbon. So if we see uh, the cumulatively since the pre-industrial 
um, the sources of carbon on the left and where that carbon now resides on the right, we see that uh, integrated over the industrial era, of course, we've put all this fossil carbon in the atmosphere. And in terms of the net, the cumulative land over the industrial era, it's actually been a net source, close to zero net carbon uh, <clears throat> to the atmosphere. Um, but where did the carbon go? Well, of course, a lot of it remained in the atmosphere, and that's why we have this increasing trend uh, that is uh, driving warming through the greenhouse effect. Uh, but about 30% of all the carbon uh, emitted has gone into the ocean. So in order to understand the future of climate change, we need to uh, be able to understand where how much carbon is going to go into the ocean in the future. And part of that is um, diagnosing what's gone in the, on in the past. Now, our challenge is that uh, the observed uh, data that we need, which is the partial pressure of CO2, uh, is actually quite sparse. These are all the data for about the past six decades, and this is one month. Uh, and you can see that that is extremely sparse data. We want to fill in all the gaps for every uh, location and space and every month over uh, the last uh, 60 years or, or more if we could. And so how do we reconstruct uh, the full coverage of PCO2 and therefore the full coverage air CO2 flux, uh, given that input data. In the past few years, people have figured out that if we use machine learning uh, to train up an algorithm, we can then extrapolate from the sparse PCO2 data to all, uh, all, um, all points using the full coverage driver data sets, such as satellite sea surface temperature, satellite chlorophyll. <clears throat> and then from that PCO2, we can calculate the air CO2 flux. And so this has been done for, for um, you know, there's several groups around the world that are doing this. I actually got into the machine learning world because I said, this is crazy. There's no way you can do this. I don't believe that it's possible. Uh, and what, uh, there's got to be huge uncertainties in these extrapolations. So what we did is we went to um, the uh, large ensemble uh, models uh, that were very much um, innovated at NCAR. If you don't know about them, I'm happy to talk more about them and use uh, large ensembles from NCAR and from three other modeling centers as, uh, as a test bed to evaluate what if we sampled as the observations, built algorithms, estimated the full field PCO2, and then the benefit of being in model space is that we know the truth. So we can statistically compare the reconstructed PCO2 uh, to the truth for each member. And then with 100 members, we can build up some statistical uh, certainty as to what, whether it's working or not. And, Lo and behold, it actually does work quite well, at least for the mean and the seasonality. Um, and so uh, we're continuing on in this work and some of this is represented in the poster. The other thing we're doing is saying, well, now, now that I proved to myself that it works, now I got to build my own algorithms with my, uh, with my group. And so one of the ways we're doing that is we're using models of the prior estimate of the surface PCO2. Instead of trying to estimate the PCO2 simply from the data, we're saying, well, those models give us a first guess. Let's uh, correct the model. So that's what we're doing here. Our prior is uh, uh, the model. The ML target is the misfit, the difference between the model and the observations. We're uh, building a full field misfit and then summing those up to get a prediction of PCO2. A benefit of that and that we're really focusing on for this project is that um, uh, we can use these misfits as a better basis upon which we can assess model skill. What I'm showing here is the full field misfit, the climatolo climatology of the four seasons. Uh, the difference in PCO2 units uh, between CSM and uh, the observations um, <laughs> across the seasons and comparing that to Princeton just as an example. And you can see that there's large spatial structure in these misfits. Uh, it's different from the Princeton model. And we believe that we can use these uh, full field misfits as a better um, way of evaluating uh, the, the model's performance and, and, and connecting it to things like sea surface temperature biases or chlorophyll biases that are more full coverage. So that's what we're working on. And uh, these are my discussion points, and I would be happy to talk to you more about it at the poster. Questions for Gail? Sorry, any questions for Gail? Yeah, Robert. Uh, I maybe you want to speak in the mic. Is is do you measure your misfit in the phase space or in the geographic space? Uh, it's it's. Uh, calculated in the phase space, but then mapped to the physical space. Yeah, yeah.
Hi everyone, my name is Florencio, uh, and this is the title that I'm work of the project I'm working on with Vanessa. Micro entrepreneurs' responses to sustainability trainings and interventions. Uh, yesterday we had an enlightening conversation with some people here, where they actually asked me, "What is a micro entrepreneur?" So, what is a micro entrepreneur? When we think of business owners and we think of businesses. There are different ways of classifying businesses depending on their size, and their size can be classified depending on, for example, number of employees or revenue. When we nor normally, when we talk about micro businesses and my and owners of micro businesses, which are micro entrepreneurs, we're talking about businesses that have less than four employees or up to four employees. In the U.S., for example, we know that there are like about 33 million businesses. And uh, 92% of these businesses are small, including micro, and 90% of small businesses are 90%, in summary, like around 85% of businesses in the U.S. are micro businesses. So the impact that these micro businesses can have is huge. And corporations are investing probably trillions of dollars every year trying to influence somehow different stakeholders, including microentrepreneurs that can be part of their supply chains. However, we have no idea whether the practices, social responsible practices, environmentally responsible practices that corporations are implementing to potentially train, for example, microentrepreneurs are effective or not. All that they say is that they train, for example, 2,000 microentrepreneurs or that they train 50,000 microentrepreneurs over the past year. We have no idea whether those trainings are effective or not. So the first research question that we're exploring is what are the effects of corporate sponsor environmental training programs on microentrepreneurs' attitudes and behaviors around climate change? Moreover, as they spend all this money implementing these programs, attrition rates are huge. So another research question that we're exploring is, what are the effects of different communication frames on microentrepreneurs' participation rates in these corporate sponsor environmental trainings? So we have like sort of two different sides to our projects. The first one is where we're actually evaluating the impact, whether these have an in, these trainings have an impact or not on the beneficiaries of the trainings. The, the second one is what is the effect if there if we can find a way through the communication of these programs to increase participation rates so that the trainings are more effective or not. We've done many different things on, on both of these areas. And our preliminary results in the second part of the project tells us that with the specific framing that we've tested, a traditional frame that has been used in many different disciplines, including public health, this gain or loss frame, we found we didn't find an effect on participation rates, but we did find an effect, small but important, on um, on the actual frequency of participation. I made a change there, but it didn't get it, it didn't get here. And then we've done many things on the first component of, of, of these uh, interventions, and we've created sessions to train entrepreneurs. We've pilot tested this, and uh, we've created psychometric measures to actually evaluate the impact of these trainings. And we will be implementing different field experiments over the course of the next year and a half to continue assessing and finding better ways to train effectively microentrepreneurs and also other stakeholders that are relevant to corporations day to day action. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Florence, I know this is a big question, but what kind of information from what Leap science, leap, the leap science you've heard about today, what do the businesses need from us? This, this is something very important, and I think it relates to other parts of the knowledge the, of the knowledge transfer. Some of the information that we are collecting in these 
baseline surveys that we use for these pilot uh, training programs, people just don't really know, don't fully understand what climate change is, mm -hmm. that it's a fact that we actually need to adapt to climate change. And um, some people don't even have negative emotions associated to climate change when they think about climate change. Some people actually feel okay about climate change, right? So they need everything. So uh, working really hard to try to ask social scientists in the room first, understand so that we can take this on uh, in, and implement it in different training sessions for just other people to understand it's just as much. So I'm happy to be here and continue learning. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah, but that's very much part of the knowledge transfer, a lot of that discussion. What is climate change? How to, yeah, so there's a lot and lot to be learned there. Thanks so much. Thanks so much about learning so great a scale or the structure in order to improve the prediction of precipitation. So the idea is that our climate model has grid size of like about hundreds of kilometers and they do not resolve any scale that is smaller than that grid size. And then they have to, okay, my equation is there, but a little bit late. So, but they have to then rely on parameterization in order to take account of that on resolved processes. That means that they assume that they can approximate whatever that is not resolved using, having, using only a uh, resolved variable. But from observation, we know that cloud can get multiple, a multi scale structure or what we call organization, and that. Uh, has been shown to be really important for uh, precipitation intensity and uh, lifetime. So what we want to do here then is to uh, verify if that assumption that we have in our parameterization is adequate for parameterizing precipitation. So there is some error, sorry. So first we want to see if uh, we can parameterize or we can predict pre precipitation by knowing only resolve variables. And then we want to see if we can somehow quantify that complicated or very complex structure that we see in cloud and then inform our parameterization about that, uh, let's say, information that I'm going to refer to that as or. So what we did, we used a simple feedforward neural network that receives, um, let's say, resolved variables or a larger scale variable as input, and it wants to predict precipitation. And that larger scale variable we uh, computed by coarse graining high resolution simulation at global scale, like global storm resolving model. So what I'm showing on the like the first plot is precipitation versus precipitable water, or like some measure of uh, humidity in the atmosphere. What we see is that we can predict like the overall behavior of precipitation and some spread in precipitation as well, but we cannot uh, have an accurate prediction. And if we look at the PDF. Uh, the tail of prediction, so that blue is the true and the orange is uh, the prediction. So we cannot predict the pain, tail of precipitation or the tail of PDF or basically like precipitation extreme. So that's sort of like the same bias that we see in, uh, in climate models. It sort of like uh, has a bias toward line rain or drizzling. So then we wanted to include um, organization in our model, but the problem is that we have to somehow like uh, quantify this very complex, complex structure that I show. So to do that, we use an uh, autoencoder. So that's a nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique that receives high resolution fields and it has to go through that bottleneck. It's very low dimension and then reconstruct the original field. So then we're going to use that bottleneck or that latent representation that you refer to as OR in order to inform our neural network about um, subgrade scale structure. So now I have two, put, two inputs for predicting precipitation. One is org and the other was uh, larger scale variables. So um, the same plot as before, but now with org. So this is that we can now accurately reproduce uh, the precipitation profile, predicting the whole uh, stochasticity that we see and also uh, accurately reproducing the PDF of precipitation. And that means that at GCM scale, most of the stochasticity that we observe is caused by uh, subgrid scale structure and we, if we could somehow learn that structure, then we can accurately predict precipitation. And that also means that we can use uh, a model like autoencoder or reduce order models in general, if we wanna somehow encode or compress information that exists in a very complex, high dimensional image or like input. Yeah, so uh, that's it, thank you.
I had one last point that okay. I forgot about. Okay, sounds good. Any questions for Sarah? Sure, Mike. I'm sure you would have a question. Like, you mean if I instead of using autoencoder, I use a simple metric? Um, so we, yeah, so we tried like replacing this um, information that we gained from autoencoder with a simple variance, I think, like variance of moisture field. So that improves the prediction, but not really the part of like the tail of the precipitation. And it seems to sort of like improve mostly the uh, the small amount of precipitation. Okay. Thanks so much, Sarah. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, thanks for doing okay, that. Great. You know, especially with COVID. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm really sorry. It's just a, a very poorly timed uh, case of COVID. I guess if I had been a week or two earlier, that would have been ideal. Whenever these things are ideal. Okay, so I'm gonna try to share my screen, um, and hopefully this works. All right, can you all see that? See that. Okay, great. And is it, Perfect. can you see everything Perfect. still? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about a project on warm microphysics. And this has a couple of different directions that we've been going in. So um, hopefully it's not too much of a, a mess. Um, and I just wanna quickly mention that uh, I won't be at my poster obviously, but um, Carol Lamb has a poster on uh, some of the autoencoder work with uh, microphysics and neural network work with, uh, with microphysics. And so you can certainly talk to her about that. Um, and then also I, I put a, um, a post in the annual meeting channel where you can ask me questions about my poster and I'll try to be online during that poster time. So you can just, you know, ask me in real time and I'll try to respond in real time there. Okay, um, I've probably used up half my time now. All right, so what's the problem? Uh, we have basically whatever goes on inside of clouds to make precipitation and to build up those clouds and make them smaller, et cetera. And what are the processes? There's all sorts of processes that happen. Um, droplets activate on uh, aerosol particles. Uh, vapor condenses upon those droplets. Those droplets collide and coalesce. They become larger um, through very often ice processes. And then they become so large uh, that when they collide with each other, they can break up into some number of smaller droplets. And they also experience evaporation. All right, so those are all the processes. Now, what's the issue? Well, one of the issues is that um, these processes are kind of uncertain at a fundamental level. So here's one just droplet breakup. Uh, you kind of have these two droplets colliding. You can already see from this picture that it's, it's a super complicated, uh, you know, fluid dynamics problem to figure out what's going to happen to these droplets. Like if you guess how many droplets are going to come out of this collision, like I'm not sure if I would put a bet on that. Is it going to be one? Is it going to be, I'm sorry, is it going to be two? Is it going to be three? Is it going to be 10? I'm not really sure. And then this is a, another image which drives that home uh, from a paper by Hugh Morrison, where it's three idealized thunderstorms. The only difference between these simulations is the droplet breakup. So this specific uh, process. And you can see how differently these storms evolve. This is sort of looking top down at the storm. All right, another big issue is how we represent uh, all these droplets, right? So we can't, ha we can't account for all of them because there's just uh, millions and trillions and billions of them. So we have to come up with statistical representation. So uh, we can either have a bulk representation um, where we just assume a statistical form for that distribution, a bin representation where we divide it up into a little histogram. In other words, uh, this histogram describes how many of each size particle there are. And then there's new methods, uh, Lagrangian particle based, where we actually carry around these droplets as they move around the cloud. And these droplets are actually, they're called super particles because they represent a multiplicity of, uh, of droplets. So each one sort of uh, accounts for some number of representatives. Uh, why isn't this moving forward? Okay, there we go. So we have two complementary approaches. One is Bayesian, where we have a uh, structurally flexible model uh, called BOSS that uh, was developed by uh, Hugh Morrison and myself. 
and recently uh, by Sean Santos. And uh, we're basically aiming to use uh, BIM and Lagrangian detailed schemes as a reference to improve these. And we want to do learning in this sort of physically based framework that's also structurally flexible. So we can play around with the structure. The training um, is expensive in this way. So it's not as easy to do as, as a neural network. And I think that's where the neural networks come in, where the machine learning really comes in. I'll leave one place where it comes in. So another, on, on the other side, we have uh, using machine learning. And this is recently, uh, Andrew Gettleman has done a lot of work on this with, um, with uh, DJ Gagne at, at NCAR. And the idea is, is somewhat similar. We use uh, BIN and Lagrangian schemes to produce training data and then do learning in some sort of offline mode um, to try to figure out how to better um, represent the, uh, the processes. Okay, and then the other thing that we can do, because this is a lot cheaper, is we can ask questions like, what prognostic moments or what variables are best to solve the problem, right? So this isn't necessarily the, a, a traditional uh, regression problem where we're just trying to get a function that fits the result. We're also asking basically, what are our fundamental variables that we should be predicting? And, uh, and one of the things that Carrie's been looking at that's really interesting is uh, what's the intrinsic dimensionality of some of these problems? In other words, how many variables do we need to solve um, for one of these processes? How much information do we really need to know about the droplet population to predict what happens in say collision coalescence? And then we use these insights to drive the physical parameterizations or if our physical parameterizations can't match that fidelity, perhaps we'll use the machine learning approaches themselves in the model. All right, so for BOSS, um, this is sort of online training that we've done. Um, and one of the things that comes out is that, uh, so this is just a, a, a idealized column model of a cloud. The details aren't that important, but uh, these two maps are error maps between BOSS, our, our sort of cheap scheme, and the reference scheme. And the big difference here is that we have a simpler version and a more complex version. And we see a clear benefit to the more complex version. We have basically just one more variable. And the key insight here, which I don't show here, but it's on the poster, is that this only comes out in offline simulations. So if we do the, I'm sorry, uh, online, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. This only comes on if we do um, online training. So in other words, training in a realistic, sort of realistic simulation. If we do this in a less realistic offline scenario where we're just matching uh, the equations, uh, you don't see the same benefit. So there's lots of reasons for that. I'd be happy to talk about that more. Uh, this is work that a, a summer student, uh, a summer LEAP uh, student uh, worked on, Ryan Anselm, um, and he looked into what moments are best. So uh, I won't go into what moments are, but basically what variables to describe the, the drop size distribution. Which ones are best for predictability? And so the best ones are sort of the ones that sit along this dark band. So those are somewhere between uh, three, I'm sorry, between four and seven. Um, anyway, uh, this is the, the work that I mentioned by Kara Lamb, looking at the intrinsic dimensionality, I'm sorry, intrinsic dimensionality of the collision coalescence problem. And it seems to hover just below three. Uh, and she, you know, you can ask her more questions about that. Um, and the future, uh, we want to look at uh, sort of breaking another structural paradigm where instead of looking at clouds and precipitation separately, which is typically what's done, to consider them together. So we've been looking at versions of BOSS that are single category, and they seem to show distinct benefits over uh, a two category approach. And then another thing that I think is really important, hopefully you can see this animation, is really doing this training in a much more realistic scenario. So one of the things we learned was that the, the online training has clear benefits over the offline. In other words, you can train offline, but it doesn't, the benefits don't carry forward to online. Um, and so we wanna move into more realistic simulations as part of our training. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, this is uh, work that Andrew Gettleman has done. So this is a um, machine learning approach where they've uh, used neural networks to match a bin scheme. And they've put this into CESM and tested it there. So that's, uh, that's sort of the stage, uh, what is it? The stage tier, I forget what it's called. That's sort of ready to go pretty much. And yeah, am I, am I out of time already? I heard Pierre pop in there. Um, 
Okay, and uh, this is just the discussion points. Uh, you know, and it's, it, I think these are really important for a lot of uh, stuff that we work on here at Leap. So physically based parameterizations versus sort of a black box approach. Um, ooh, yeah. Okay. Um, and then structural errors, are they mostly related to the functional form or the prognostic variables? Uh, offline versus online, how best to use real observations, laboratory? Um, and then how do we fit this into a climate model? Uh, sorry for taking up so much time. Um, so if we have additional questions for the speakers, please uh, raise that now and people can answer that. That'd be great, including to Marcus as well. Yeah, in the back. Maybe we can circulate the mics as well because that might be. Yeah, maybe for, for Marcus. Talk on my micro entrepreneurs and sustainability. Uh, one of the questions I had was like, what is the makeup of the micro entrepreneurs that were like sampled? Like, do we have any insight onto like how much the practices and these kinds of trainings would relate to their individual like fields of business or, or like, is there any data like that relates that in any way? I guess that could be useful for like seeing how, like what types of micro entrepreneurs we should maybe target over others in that training. Uh, yes, we here. So we've we've actually implemented trainings for bodegueros and bodegueras okay. specifically, and then we've also implemented trainings for a very diverse set of micro entrepreneurs, where you just couldn't point to like a specific type of 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 small business or of micro business. Uh, we, in the next stage, will actually be following up by visiting these micro businesses to better understand specifically what are the sort of, of environmentally friendly practices that can and are influenced by these trainings. Right now, it's more we've created this psychometric measure and we're just asking them questions at the end of the training to see whether, you know, comparing post versus pre to, serve, to see whether there's a change in that. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, <laughs> so that's an easy one. Um, maybe same. Um, so we talk about a lot of the like, climate data set, but I wonder if um, I'm not, I don't really know about any human related socioeconomic, like global, like large data set. So I wonder if there's any, so we can incorporate like those into our training for certain research, yeah. Um, I'm not really sure if there's like any big database that we could use for that. Right now we're in a stage where we're actually trying to determine causality, what is actually effective and why that is effective. So our approach right now is conducting field experiments uh, where we have treatment groups, alternative treatment groups and, and no treatment groups as well that allows us to see what causes what, right? Yeah, My question is, oh, oh no, go ahead. My question is for Jerry Lynn. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, um, you're using the machine learning, you're using emulator to sort of find the parameters. And my question is, how do you know that the emulators would sort of work in scenarios for which they have not been trained? There's so much variability and so much richness in the structure. You know, you can only train them on, on, on a few samples. And, and how do you take them in different places and, and, and still hope that they would work? Well, and that's certainly the big question. Um... Neural networks are really good at interpolating, but they're terrible at extrapolating. So generalizing is always going to be difficult. Um, and there's no real way to guard against every possible scenario because online they can drift to scenarios you wouldn't have thought of put in the test set or in the training set. Um, and this is why we need to be more thoughtful about uh, how we train them and ways we can uh, account for uncertainty and spread. 
I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, no, 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 no. I, no, I think you're answering it right. And and my question to the the speakers that sort of talked about in the very very first two talks is is this problem related to the sampling? You know, I guess you talked about the sampling, um, uh, and if you don't sample it enough, maybe you can't find the right parameterization. So is there is there a combination of problems that are sort of in in estimation and calibration that needs to be sort of figured out and resolved somehow in the context of machine learning? Uh, yeah, I, th I think. Um, someone else here brought up a really good point about potential of not having data set that represents the hardest uh, samples that would be uh, emphasized. So uh, as an example, in the GIF that was in my slides, there is an animation of uh, the neural networks of synergy over uh, the entire globe across different time steps. And perhaps one way of uh, making the training set more powerful is by only including um, test case, or cases where the uncertainty is high and just having a training set filled with those scenarios so that you can uh, improve your performance on online. I, I had two quick questions for, for Linnea. How many parameters were in that summary? Um, and uh, for Greg, you said that you want to work on evolving your surrogate methods, but the skill looked pretty good on your one-to-ones and Maybe those are for global means and what, what is next or highest priority behind the global mean as it, where do they fail? Is it spatial RMSCs or seasonal cycles or what's top of your list? Yeah, thank you. Um, we started with narrowing down just, or trying to define what is a parameter in the land surface model and pulled out 200 to begin with related to many different processes. But then when we narrowed it down to a subset of that to focus specifically on global leaf area, we were working with 32 parameters. Um, and then to your question, Mike, um, I showed three examples for just three observational metrics. We really have about 35. Um, the middle one of, of the three, um, you saw that the scatter was not exactly aligned along the one-to-one -one line. There are other parameter, other output metrics for which there is also scatter. And so it's the correlation is high, but we think that um, some of that scatter. Uh, so then, when we run the um, Markov you know, Monte Carlo framework on the emulator to infer parameters, we know that only thirty percent of the time do we get a good parameter configuration. That um, that it, that gives a result that when we actually run those through the actual model, agrees with what the emulator said. So that's how we knew that, you know. If I zoomed in more <laughs> on the uh, on the scatter plots, perhaps that would be more evident. But um, so that's how we, that's how I made that that judgment. Um, I don't have a question. I have an answer for like a question that was asked three questions ago. So I should have probably yelled or something. Sorry, I just felt I didn't, I felt shy. Um, I think you asked about socioeconomic global data. I'm not a social scientist or an expert on this topic, but my understanding is I think the World Bank has some of those uh, data. And I only know this because I, go I Googled like urban uh, urbanization and like some sort of rate and I was able to get it through the World Bank and they have lots of other variables, if that's helpful. Thanks so much. You should uh, probably stop and maybe we'll uh, get to the next session. And maybe we can start thinking also because we will have the focus group uh, breakouts and. It seems that there are some emergent themes here, right? We talked about data poorness, like Galen alluded to some of that. What type of algorithms can we use? Jerry also mentioned some of that. What do you do? How do you extrapolate things like that? So it seems that, and um, Greg was talking about structural errors. How do you use multiple metrics? Uh, Linia also did that. So it seems that there are emergent themes that are cross dis disciplines here that we could potentially populate or discuss during the focus group, just putting some seeds here. Great. So thanks, everyone. Great speech. Uh, speech. Uh, that was uh, amazing. Now we are going to move on to um, Lee Pangeo and to and the carbon plan infrastructure. Hi, right, everybody. I think we'll get started. Um, I'm Jeremy Freeman from Carbon Plan. Uh, we brought the band. Uh, this is Anderson and this is Kata. Uh, we're all going to be talking today, um, and also we're going to do about half an hour here, and then James Monroe from 2I2C is going to speak as well. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that we Pangeo 
this is Lee Pangeo overview, it is really kind of a broad umbrella that incorporates a lot of different components. And I think we, all of us working on the different parts of this, want it to maybe seem like a single platform, but actually there are a lot of pieces to it. And the goal of this presentation uh, is to take you through and sort of jump into detail into a couple of those components. Um, and most of these are components that are still in development. And I think what we're most excited to get out of this, uh, uh, well, presentation, and then also the conversations that follow, and the reason we're really excited to be here at this meeting is to really better understand, uh, as we think about different pieces and different components of this platform, whether tools for visualization or data processing, we want to understand what's useful, and we want to understand what's going to enable really interesting use cases across Leap. Um, so that's why we're here, and that's what we're really excited about. Um, the other thing I want to call out is that Leap Pangeo really is, is both a platform and a bunch of components under that platform, and it's also a bunch of people, and the people are the, the, the ones that are really building and making all this work. Um, so a huge shout out in particular to Ryan and Julius, who've really uh, been, been leading um, and, and just been visionary around how to uh, leverage these kinds of tools to enable science. Um, our team has been working especially on things related to uh, web-based visualization, and that's what we're going to hear about. Um, as well as the Pangeo Forge platform, and that's what you're going to hear about from Anderson. Um, and then another key component is is the hub, uh, and that's the Jupiter Hub, where all of the data analysis actually happens. And uh, what we're going to do here is the three of us are, or two of us are going to chat, um, and then James is from 2I2C is going to tell you about the Jupiter Hub piece. Um, so with that intro, I will turn it over to Anderson to talk about Pangeo Forge. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Anderson. Um, I work as a software engineer at Carbon Plan. And as Jeremy mentioned, uh, one of the projects that we're involved in is Pangeo Forge, uh, which is a broad multi-stake community project that aims to democratize the production of analysis ready cloud optimized datasets. And you may be wondering why do we need uh, analysis ready cloud optimized datasets? Um, as you probably know, plenty of uh, publicly available climate and weather datasets um, that exist today are published or were published under a framework that focuses on the preservation and uh, archival quality. And as a result, as a user, if you want to use uh, these datasets today, you basically have to do a bit of work to clean them. Um, and uh, if you think about it, uh, I'm assuming here uh, there's a bunch of scientists that basically have their own version or their own copies of different data sets that they've cleaned, but everybody basically does their own thing. And uh, what Conjure Forge is basically trying to help with here is to uh, empower users uh, through the curation or public curation and uh, production of data sets that anyone can use. Um, and uh, that is done through what we're calling Pangeo Forge Cloud here, which provides uh, infrastructure for executing uh, and curating uh, what we call recipes. And uh, a recipe uh, is basically a collection of uh, Python code that um, provides instructions on how to basically identify the source of the data um, and uh, additional instructions for pre-processing. So in this case, like cleaning or organizing data sets and recipes are contributed through GitHub. Uh, so this is where the community aspect of it uh, comes in place. And um, users basically can suggest uh, changes or what they want uh, to be done on a particular data set. And as I was saying, uh, this is basically Python code. And in addition to that collaboration through GitHub, uh, Pangeo Forge provides infrastructure for executing these recipes. And what you get at the end of this process is um, a data set um, that is uh, analysis ready in the sense that anyone anywhere in the world can basically point to this data set and just uh, do whatever uh, analysis they want to do on it. Um, so as an example here, we have this page that uh, gives you a bit of information about uh, the provenance of this data set. So this is a copy of an existing data set, but this copy is publicly available and anyone can use it and uh, basically provide some information on uh, or a preview of what's in that data set. Um, um, so this might be uh, uh, might look familiar to some of you here. Um, so this is one data set. Uh, a second here. Um, 
but as I mentioned, this is community driven. So there's a bunch of these uh, right now. And uh, as a user, you can actually navigate uh, through the, or the catalog to find uh, which data sets have been uh, produced. Uh, but this is Pangeo Forge specific. And uh, another whole piece of, of what we're doing or working on is uh, building a data catalog for leap uh, data sets. And I'll let Cater uh, talk about that. Thanks, Anderson. Um, yeah, like Anderson said, I'm Kata. I'm a software engineer at Carbon Plan as well. Um, and in addition to the Pangeo Forge catalog you saw, we're imagining a component of um, the work we do to, be, to build a data catalog that collects um, research output from you all at Leap. So that could include data sets that are created and coming from Pangeo Forge, but also other data sets from elsewhere and models and other artifacts um, and presented together in a like usable and searchable way to make the work coming out of Leap more discoverable. Um, here is a very basic mock-up of what that might be. Um, and I think it's really like a matter of collaboration that we figure out what would be the most usable um, version of this, uh, both for within Leap and then also for broadcasting the work outside of Leap. Um, Another uh, uh, web product that we're imagining um, to uh, elevate the data coming out of Leap is uh, sort of an article-like format that we're calling data explainers, um, where scientists could explain uh, in a tone for a broad audience uh, their, their work um, and their data, uh, leveraging um, interactive graphics that uh, incorporate the data and um, Maybe in this mock, they're like uh, grabbing the location and the time ranges that are of interest to users and making um, data, uh, yeah, just really easy to interact with. Um, and yeah, the final kind of component, um, the, the web component that we're, we've focused a lot of our attention on to date um, is around data visualization. Um, and at Carbon Plan, uh, we've long felt that data visualization is really important to understanding the data that's coming out of research. Um, and so by way of example, in the this past year, we put out our own um, CMIP6 downscaling data set. Um, and as part of that release, alongside the data itself, we created um, a web map um, that allows you to explore <laughs> the different data sets that we created. Um, and pan through them and inspect the data, um, looking at it at different time points um, and pulling up time series um, just to kind of bring to the surface uh, everything that's within the data. Um, and we wanted to take this idea uh, from, yeah, we want to take this idea and sort of generalize it so that this type of visualization would be possible for any publicly available data set. Um, and so with that in mind, we've been exploring this idea of a general purpose data viewer. Um, if you're familiar with NCView, uh, we've taken a lot of inspiration from that and we think that this could potentially be a modern successor to that. Um, the idea being that if there is a publicly available data set, you plug it in, um, here's our CMIP6 data, we're not plugging that too hard. Um, and you could oh, pull up plots, um, just like we had in our own tool, um, maybe do some debugging, um, looking at diagnostics of the data uh, as you're during the research process. Um, and, uh, but yeah, this is still pretty early. We have uh, a lot of generalization work to do to take, you know, we made this one off web tool to elevate our own work, um, but we want to make this um, a tool that can be reused again and again. Um, so hopefully this works. Uh, so this is where we're at with the prototype right now. Um, we're in the beginning of this sort of un, kind of start restarting from scratch to build what we've built before, um, but in a way that can support broad use cases. Um, and so um, I'm going to pull up the data set here.
Okay. That was, that was a struggle, but here we are. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is actually a sea surface temperature that uh, Anderson had pulled up. It's coming from Pangeo Forge. Um, and, um, and we've plugged it in and we can just very quickly create this plot on the web, which we can um, pan around and zoom through um, and look at in different projections. Um, and you know, we can add different uh, <laughs> different uh, base maps and play with the color range. Um, so we have this very dynamic uh, web map that uh, yeah we can use to kind of inspect the data or potentially share the data with someone else. Um, and then here's another example that will take me several minutes to pull up. <laughs> Um, so there are many challenges in addition to the kind of like general purpose nature of this tool that we're thinking through. One of them um, is for higher resolution data. How do you get that all into the web at once? Um, and so what we're doing here is uh, it's actually been pre-processed because we've already looked at this data set before, but we're creating a more um, like web optimized version of the data set, um, which allows you to like reasonably load up little bits of it at a time um, and pan around through. Uh, it's going to work slow. Uh, pan around and get a view of this really quite large, um, this is like an observational data set. Um, and yeah, so quite early days, but um, we're excited about the progress we're making here. And we think uh, that this will be useful. Um, and yeah, so we kind of stepped through a bunch of different components here. They're all, I think, um, we're, we're excited to, to talk to you guys about them at this meeting, but also just in general, um, because I think we're really open to them being shaped by what will be useful for you all. Um, and also how they'll all fit into a platform, which is a word we've been throwing around. Um, yeah, so that's all we have from the carbon plan side. Thank you. Okay, thanks so uh, much. James is now gonna come up um, from 2i2c. Um, I might just add one last thing to what, uh, well, actually two last things to what Kato was saying. One, we were really excited to have arbitrary map projections in the browser, because I think that's something that people in like the normal web mapping community don't care about, but I feel as a scientist, hopefully fellow scientists like care a lot about choice of map projection. So hopefully people are excited about that. Uh, the other thing just to say, what Kato was showing there where you like drag and drop the czar file, and then look at it, our goal, our vision is that that works for any czar file generated by anybody in this room. So like for any project anyone is working on, this should let you look at your data right away. And our goal is to get to that point. So we very much want to understand what it needs to do to make that possible. Um, so let that be some fodder maybe for a conversation after the, after the presentation here. Thanks so much. I think there's a potential for very fruitful discussion. Yeah, or if I has knowledge transfer, et cetera. Um, yeah, maybe we can take a few questions. We have one time, yeah, Andrew. Okay. Oh, sure. Could you think carbon plan? Yeah, for yeah we just sort of jumped right in. Um, yeah, I, I, sure. Uh, so uh, we are a, a nonprofit research organization, um, about 12 people. Uh, our focus is data and science for climate action. Um, and that's a pretty broad, broad scope. Uh, most of our work is focused on a few key areas um, of work. So we've done a lot of work related to carbon offsets. We've done a lot of work on uh, carbon removal. And then over the last several months, um, we've been ramping up some new work around climate risk and, and, and climate impacts. Um, you know, we are a, a research organization. Um, and in the process, we definitely do research that ends up in, you know, publications and places like that. But really what we focus on is finding ways to take research that is happening and, and analysis we can do either of public data um, or of sort of intersections between research data and, and, and public data and find ways for that to have direct impact on, on important ongoing conversations related to climate change. Um, so again, in the area of carbon offsets, a lot of our work has been analyzing ways that, well, carbon offsets have, have worked or more often have not worked, um, and then making that something that the public is aware of. Um, we've collaborated with investigative journalists to get stories out about really important aspects of basically what climate solutions are working and which ones are not working. Um, and our goal is to make sure we are doing more of the things that work and less of the things that don't work and that everything we're doing has scientific integrity and, and respects what we know about the science. Yeah. And our website is carbonplan.org. 
and there's a lot more, a lot more there. So thanks for the question. Um, I think we had the first in the back. So I cannot see. Yeah. No? That is a true. That is a true statement. We should incorporate that into our uh... <laughs> next time we talk. That was great. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and the one uh, I don't know caveat clarification maybe is that uh, I don't want to go too deep for because maybe not everyone will be interested in this. But um, the format, the czar format, which is what we we use for a lot of data analysis, and also we're using for data visualization here. Um, there are certain czar data sets that need to be reprocessed before they work for visualization purposes. And a lot of that has to do with chunk size. I don't want to get too wonky for everybody, but for those of you who know what uh, the chunk size is in the czar data set, um, when the chunks are really big, that often works well for, for analysis purposes, but it doesn't work very well, well for visualization purposes. So for those data sets, when we are doing what we showed here, we're actually rechunking it uh, on the back end. That is also happening in the cloud, and you are still looking at data that is in the cloud, but there is this extra transformation that has to take place. Um, but yeah, 100% the data start in the cloud, and then you're looking at data in your web browser, you're never downloading anything. So in that sense, yes, it is totally different than NCview. Yeah, a couple of questions in the back. Uh, yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, I'd say it happens quite organically um, in, in the sense that a lot of uh, the projects we've worked on have involved building relationships with partners and collaborators, um, folks who are aligned generally with our values and our interests. Um, and in general, the, when we do the, especially those kinds of projects, um, and maybe for context, this was a case where we partnered with um, some really fantastic researchers at, at UC Irvine um, to take what they had built, which was a techno-economic model around uh, the potential and, and cost of seaweed farming as a form of carbon removal, and then build a sort of interactive web map to explore the, the uh, parameter space and, and give people more um, intuition and understanding around that. Um, that was a case where you know, carbon removal is kind of big picture, an a big interest area of ours. Um, and then this was interesting research happening with some folks that we happen to um, have some existing relationships and partnerships with. Um, so often it's about, you know, alignment in terms of values and interests and, you know, specifically to the kind of big areas that we tend to work in. Um, but, you know, we've had collaborations like that in areas related to, you know, everything from sort of forest monitoring and forest carbon mapping, um, really anything related to carbon removal. Um, and then more recently, some things related to, to climate risks and climate impacts. And we're always looking for, yeah, new, new partners and collaborators. Other questions? Yeah. If you know, yeah, you have a little bit. Well, and component in the space, of course, Google Google Maps have already figured out the solutions. In time, there are lots of different processes happening at different scales. If our station is not going to change by the minute, there are some things will change very, very fast. Good. Great question. Um, I'd say in some ways a, a motivating, uh, oh, great, it's going to maybe demo some stuff. Um, in some ways, a, mo a motivation for, for the use of the czar format is that uh, really exactly as you're saying, czar kind of generalizes, in my bird's eye view, czar generalizes what a lot of web mapping has done for space and just generalizes its other dimensions. That's what's so beautiful about the format. Um, so for a lot of what we do here, uh, space and time are sort of treated similarly. Every, you know, at the end of the day, you just have a giant, n-dimensional data set and it's chunked. And this map is actually flying through both space and time. And you know, you what you see most visually is the space part. But then as Kate is doing this right now, we're moving through the data in time. And technically what happens is that wherever you are in both space and time, we grab the chunks of the corresponding n-dimensional data set. And that's what you see. And if you chunk the data, and again, how to do chunking correctly, very, very, very hard problem. 
But if you chunk well for your use case, and that use case is visualization, then you can have really good performance in both space and time. Hi, yeah. Um, this looks like a great tool. I'm very excited to use it. Uh, I was wondering if there's a way to, um, if you're looking at a specific region to extract that data from what you're seeing at that moment, uh, to immediately extract that, or do you have to like manually look at what the latitude and longitude grid is and go back to use our file and extract that? Or is that something that could be done automatically? We're doing neither now, but the, that's exactly the kind of thing that's helpful to hear. I think we're definitely imagining some kind of like, surely you can pull up like, at a point the data for that point but i think yeah like if there if there are helpful formats for downloads that's the sort of thing we'd love to talk about yeah what i always say about the web and uh these two find it a little annoying sometimes i'd, I'd say anything is possible which is actually true um you really can do a lot and i think there's a whole range of possibilities here everything as kate said from like you just want to see the data for a little window right there in the browser that's kind of one thing there's, I want to download the data for my little window that up to a certain size is feasible. And then also there's maybe the possibility for integration with a sort of Jupyter-like environment where you can sort of immediately go back and forth between seeing this in the browser and then working with the data from that corresponding location in your notebook. I think all three of those things should be possible. Cool. Great. Thank you. Great. I think we should move on. Thanks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> can we leave that to the end? Maybe that's okay. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> I could see some despair here. Um, okay, thanks so much. Yeah, it was fantastic to hear. Well, good afternoon, everybody. So just to tie into the, the previous question about taking some mapping data that you might want to explore, I see that data visualization tool is basically a web-only way of doing it. I would assume for many in this room, you're more interactive with your data. You're using the same tooling in the web, but maybe you want to then bring that data into a Jupyter lab, Jupyter notebook-like experience and do some other visualization, slicing or dicing in other ways. The tools behind Data Viewer, I assume, and you can correct me, are really the same tools you have access to within the Jupyter Hub environment. And um, I'm James Nero. I'm here representing 2IQC, and we do some of the cloud infrastructure behind the Jupyter Hub components of Leap Pangeo. So, so Pangeo as a concept, as a community, as an idea, uh, a bunch of participants who are trying to solve the problem of really big data in the geosciences, ocean, atmosphere, cryosphere, uh, doing geospatial analytics in the cloud, not GIS, but sort of the full, the full 4D or more dimensions. Um, and that community uh, came together and looked at some technologies, whether or not they'd be things like X-Array and DASC, uh, some data formats that arise during the history of that, like czar, some visualization packages, and put together and demonstrated we could effectively do big data geoscience at scale if we use the cloud to leverage that. So to make that work, right, we had to do some, some engineering on the back end, right? So you had some data, right? So the data might, might be like, like this here in a czar data void, and it's chunked appropriately, however that might be, and it sits in either Microsoft Azure or AWS or Google. Um, we need some distributed parallel system to work with it. Dask is pretty common. And then you want to access it with your favorite data science environment. Um, Python is pretty big in this community, but other communities use R. You have different libraries, pandas, numpy, x-ray, that you might do it. And because it's in the web, you got to worry about authentication, so you need some system. So this kind of scalable computing hub arose as a pattern within Pangeo. Now, similarly, at about the same time, similar tools are being developed in the education space, like data science, right? That one of the core words behind what LEAP is, right? Pre-2013, that phrase wasn't in the, 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 the populace, right? We didn't talk about that, but we've, we've rebranded, we call ourselves data scientists, and suddenly we're the hottest thing since sliced bread. So you have all these students who want to take courses in data science. They want to use these tools and they want to use these tools to do machine learning uh, with Python or with R in the cloud and use that whole software stack. And so you've got groups like the, the Data A group at Berkeley who want to teach this en masse to thousands and thousands of students and they don't want to install the software in each one of those laptops. So, so that project occurred and through that project, um, coming through and interfacing with the Jupyter project, uh, we had a, a similar software stack. 
where you had all these users, in this case, students who want to do something on the web using Python um, or R to access some data sets. They could be big cloud data sets or maybe something smaller. You got to do a few other things, maybe the textbooks online, their educators, maybe you got to have a grading system, but you have these components that were all out there. Now, people like this. People looked at Pangeo, people looked at Berkeley and says, we want that. Uh, can, can we get one of those? And, and for a while there was like, well, yeah, you just need to have a Kubernetes engineer on staff, no problem. Um, there's an organization that, that came, came around that said, what we, we want to do is we want to be able to expand this out to lots of different groups. We want to give groups the ability to have these kind of composable architectures so that your users, students, scientists, get some nice Jupyter Notebook front end. But on the back end is this highly scalable um, infrastructure letting you loop big data. We don't want to be tied into any particular cloud platform, right? We don't want vendor lock-in. We don't want to necessarily go with Google or Amazon or Microsoft. We want to have some flexibility. We want to be open as a, as, um, a principle. We like to do open science. We, we also want to have control. Like it, it, as scientists, as tinkerers, as engineers, we like to know how things are built. Even if we're never going to actually take it apart, we want to know in principle we could take it apart, right? We're just generally apprehensive about proprietary technology. We're like, Ugh. We've been caught before where a service you've been using and you love just disappears suddenly for business reasons. And you're like, mm, it'd be really great to be based my research on something that in principle I could take with me and keep on using. So there was the need to try and solve this problem and scale it out to integrate and customize and build these platforms in the cloud to do big data big data for, for, for science and education. And so that's the backstory of 2I2C, the International Interactive Computing Collaboration. We're a team of about eight people in six countries, um, founded as a nonprofit, to sort of facilitate being one of the partners who can deliver on that. And we're happy to work with the LEAP as one of those, those partners um, to provide, be a service provider, to handle all the, the backend plumbing so that you can do the science that, that we've been hearing about at this workshop. Um, we're a collaborator with research and educators. We're not, we don't see ourselves as a vendor. Um, I, I, I get to come to workshops like this and I want to know how, what your challenges are in using the platform, both working with software engineers like a carpet plan, but also on the actual postdocs and the graduate students. What frustrates you and how can we help make it less frustrating so you can focus your time and energy on the science? Um, we're also heavily involved in the open source communities that we base on. So we've used the word Jupyter. The Jupyter Project is the group behind a lot of these tools. Most all, all of our engineers are core contributors to the Jupyter Project. That's where they came from. That's what they're involved in. So we're, we're a team of some cloud infrastructure engineers or site reliability engineers keeping this system up and running so you can do your science. So generally, when we talk about a hub, there's what Jupyter Hub, like Leap uses, is an example of it. Um, it's, it's this combination of tooling, right? Somewhere out there in, in the cloud, there are environments. And so I think for the Leap one, the default environment is a Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook, but it doesn't have to be. If you happen to be in our studio kind of shop, that could be the, the interface. In fact, there are some groups who are like, no, you know what? I, my data is in the cloud. But to be honest, we're still a MATLAB group. I, I need MATLAB in the cloud. For that group, we just spin up an arbitrary Linux desktop environment in the cloud because the architecture is composable. So there's an authentication layer through the web. It's on your laptop. You're connecting to something in the public cloud. And then from that public cloud, you connect to that data wherever it happens to be. So that's sort of the system of what 2I2C does. We maintain these these open infrastructures using Jupyter technology, but also something called Kubernetes on the back end. Uh, and we do this over all the different cloud providers to make this, this happen. So you can think of us sort of like Jupyter Hub distributions as a service. Uh, if you've ever played around with Linux as a distribution, right? You know, there's different ways of putting the pieces together. 2IDC is one of the providers of those distributions. It's a particular way of putting together all of the different tooling. So you can have dozens to thousands of concurrent users on one platform for collaboration between them, sharing of resources, putting on software. Um, we have a way we, we, we sort of done best practices. It's very, very open. 
Um, and we want to work with both open source communities and communities in research and education to, to advance that. So we're very much on developing partnerships with, with other groups to see how we can advance what we're doing. Uh, and everything we do is in the open, not just open source, but the infrastructure itself is, is all on GitHub. You, you can go and see how we've configured things. And other than a few security API keys, it's all there. Um, 2IGC itself is actually a very open organization. If you go on to 2IGC's website, you'll see our team compass, our internal documentation, how we structure things, who we are. Um, we are a very transparent, flat organization. Um, related to the Jupyter project. So Jupyter, you can think, there's this technology called Jupyter Hub, but the Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab. There's another related project to it called Binder. So, so Binder is a piece of technology that tries to build open source tools to solve the reproducibility situation. So reproducibility, right? To get what you are doing, your science, to run on someone else's computer, it, it, it's, it's hard, right? Because you have a lot of moving pieces that have to be configured. We would love to be able to share what we do, the science we do with another colleague so they could verify what we're doing, they could build upon what we're doing, um, I'm a mathematician. That's how I got into the whole science thing way back when. And the tradition there was proofs, right? I could explain something to you, show you my proof. You could go through every step of my proof and replicate what I come with. And then we'd agree, we have discovered something. When you talk about these large computational workflows, which require some data, and then this software stack of 10, 20, 30 libraries and a bunch of processing. And at the end of the day, you get this plot. And especially if there's some machine learning in there, which has this black box effect. And then you try and convince someone else going, oh yeah, this is what this does. How do you convince them? How do you let them replicate what you've done and build upon it? So, so Binder is a community of people who are trying to solve it. So I'll give you a story. Okay, so, so Jane here has, has written some paper based on a bunch of machine learning experiments. And what she wants to do is she wants to let the world reproduce the work, build on it, extend it, cite it, um, check it, and, and generally improve it, right? Doing this to try and have impact in the world. But that project has been documented maybe as a Jupyter Notebook, a bunch of steps, and it's got the code, it's got links to the data, which is on the cloud, and it's got all of the text in that paper. And she wants to take that thing and hand it to a colleague, um, maybe that she knows, or maybe someone in the future, so that they can replicate the, the thing. So what she's going to do is she's going to take that code, take that data with the links to the cloud and a representation of the configuration of the environment, all of the libraries and operating systems and specific versions. Because if you work with software for a while, you know that things are always changing, right? The options and the API calls and the code we're using, it's all in flux. We are actively developing it. So what works today may not work. In, in a year or two or three, but for reproducibility, we need that to work. And so the idea of a binder is to package all of that together, the configuration, the notebook, and links to all the resources so that anybody, someone else within your research group, someone else which is an institution, the same collaboration, or anywhere in the world can reproduce this thing. So this is what the binder project does, is it's taken the idea of a Jupyter Hub and made it so that you get arbitrary execution virus spun up at, at once. Within 2i2c, Jupyter hubs are sort of persistent environments which are always created. Binders uh, are ephemeral instances that get created on demand. And if you've ever looked at this or tried to work with one, they sound really cool, except for you got to wait like six or seven minutes for it to appear, which is both frustrating and like incredibly impressive. It's like building a whole computer from scratch. It, we want the best of both worlds. We want arbitrary execution of environments shared between people, but then some persistence so that you doing your work can get that going all the way, uh, get that quick for yourself again and again. So 2 IPC is engaged in a project right now on basically persistent binder hubs or binderized Jupyter hubs. I'm not quite sure way we'll phrase it, but that's the kind of internal work we're doing trying to advance this, this, this notion. So 2IDC is in this business of creating communities. They're currently surrounded around hubs. They could be around any sort of Kubernetes-backed thing in the infrastructure. Uh, we're cloud agnostic. 
And if you're looking for partnerships in terms of, I got this workflow and I want to get it out to someone else within Leap or out to the world, we'd love to talk to you about how to make that work. And we are working with you already on that. In terms of some values, 2 i 2 cs is a nonprofit, very open. One of the things we pride as a value is something called the right to replicate. We never liked vendor lock-in when we were scientists. Um, we don't require that. So everything we do in principle, at some point, if you want to fork not just the code, but the infrastructure and run it yourself, go ahead. This is, this is, this is fine. This is a quality of open science that we want in principle that you can do it on your own. It's up to you what you want to run on the platform, but you have the right to replicate it. Vendor lock-in is an anti-pattern for 2i2c. Related to that right to replicate, there's actually something we're playing around with called the right to participate. We want you, as a scientist, you're curious, if you want to, if you want to understand the details of how all that software which you sit on top of, both the software and the infrastructure, you want to get in there and you want to learn about that, we welcome your involvement. You have a right to participate in that whole software stack. People have their strengths. You don't need to, but there's, there's that group of individuals who are like the quasi-science, quasi-engineer, somewhere in the middle. Um, we're trying to enable and support those individuals. So in summary, when you think of 2I2C, think of it as being a technology organization that builds and configures these kinds of, of of systems. We've got on staff a number of uh, site reliability engineers, Kubernetes people who keep this infrastructure up and, and running. We can work with any of the major cloud vendors. Currently, it's those three, but in principle, we could do anything that is Kubernetes. Um, and we spin up a number of clusters and hubs, Leap being one of them. One of my visions for, for this, and so I, I work sort of as a community lead connecting all these groups together, is I'm trying to set it up so that as you move through your career from institution A to B to C, you can create this kind of environment in whatever cloud environment you maybe have some credits to spend on, or alternatively, as data gets stored in the cloud on different spots, um, the different cloud vendors are separate systems, and but even within a cloud vendor, they're regionalized. So if you have data in the Western US, that doesn't mean it's actually easily accessible from say South America, it, sometimes you have to run your computation close to where the data is. So what I'm imagining here, and we're getting there, is a federation of these kind of hubs. So that you as a scientist, you, you move to where your data is, you replicate your workflow across most of these hubs, you share with your colleagues and those following, this is how I do my science so we can collaborate. It's been, we're may, hopefully making it easy to collaborate cross institutional within one hub. Um, what we're trying to go to, or my vision, is I want to see what happens when we're talking about true open science and we're collaborating over national boundaries across organizations. What are technologies we can do to, to build that? So a federation of, of, of these, these Jupiter hubs is part of the work we're, we're working on. So uh, in, in closing, do uh, i do see we're a nonprofit trying to solve this particular uh, problem. As you are doing especially your level one projects, right? So they, they're not quite a production level and you come up with this complicated stack and well, you needed a special library that only you've got. And you're like, I need to package this this away so that other people within the Leap community can run that, right? Especially if it's sitting on Jupyter Hub, there are ways of packaging that software in a reproducible way. Now, within Leap, I, I would first point you to Oris Julius, and be like, he's your man, he could do everything. But we, as site reliability engineers, uh, support all of you through Julius. So if, if something goes through him and he's like, hey, um, he'll pick up the phone and probably not phone me, but one of the people I work with and within a few hours, we'll, we'll either figure it out or together we'll advance the science. Thanks very much. Very nice, thank you. We have uh, still a few minutes for questions. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Back <laughs> later. Yeah. Um, so, so when you say how to use binders, so there's, there's, there's two users groups in this mind. So there's the users as in the people who log on 
to, to have some experience, right? Like you're, you're a scientist, you're doing it. And that's very much the training that occurred with it just last, last week. The demo that we're going to do this afternoon on, on Leap Pangeo, that, that's sort of that user level training. And that's usually done by the particular organizations we work with because it's focused. If you're talking about the user as in the technical people within the organizations who are trying to set this up for this community, I'm happy to run that training whenever there's a group who, who wants it. So it depends a little bit on what you're trying to achieve in that, in that, in that training. Um, I'd run it if no one else within the community is already able to run it. I just need demand for it. So if you need that training, talk to me and will it provide it or partner with someone who can provide it. So I just want to reiterate, we'll be sending a survey after this meeting asking you about what your data needs are, what your training needs are. So it's important to respond to that because then we'll work with both carbon plan and QI2C to make sure that we're getting the kinds of experiences that you need. And then you'll very much help them develop things on the back end as well. Thanks so much, Kobe. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, well, quite a few there. <laughs> okay. Question. Um, can you explain the difference between binders and containers? Are they or sort of the same thing or sort of the same thing. So, so a binder it, it, internal to the code of what makes a binder a binder is a certain way of thinking about a repository of code that includes the documentation on the, on the, um, the environment. And then we it runs through a tool called repo to Docker, which basically takes that and then using some automation turns that into a Docker container. And then that container is what's actually spun up and you interact with the container is not persistent. The configuration is. Are you aiming to have to I to see the OS agnostic as well? I mean, it would be really amazing to have libraries that run on Windows, Linux, and Mac, but I can't really envision it. Well, so, so a lot of what we do is cloud infrastructure, right? So it, I, I am not aware right now, like I guess Azure has some, some Windows cloud cloud stuff, but most of the Kubernetes deployments I'm familiar with are Linux based in terms of their OS. So in terms of that low level OS that they're running, it's probably a core OS or something that's very relatively simplistic. Um, the distributions can be any, uh, like what you build a container from, they might be Ubuntu, they might be some, some Red Hat derivative, they could be, be whatever. But if you're thinking, I want to be able to run something on my my desktop Windows machine or my desktop Mac machine. Um, I think then what you're more thinking is like more containerization. Like, cause we can, we can run that on like on a Mac or a Windows. I, I have both heads of machines and on both machines, they're able to virtualize and spin up containers arbitrarily. Uh, so there's, there's different technology. You wouldn't need Kubernetes if you're just running on a single fixed machine. So, um, no, but that's just because it, it doesn't fit a need. I think that very many people actually have. All right, thank you. Yeah. Maybe Dave will be a new customer, customer for CSM on the cloud, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Hey, thanks for the great presentation, James. Um, I've been using the Leap Hub for quite a while, probably longer than a lot of people in the room because working with Ryan and Julius, um, and I found it really good and crunched through lots of data with it. One point of friction I have had is like trying to manage different like Conda environments and different packages and stuff. I'm just wondering if you've had any plans around that. It depends on, on how you're trying to solve it. Are you trying to solve it as an individual researcher as, or as a group? Um, as a group, what I would say, and this is again, we work with Julius and Julius works with us. Um, it, it, we can we can create multiple environments that are sort of like, uh, especially when talking about machine learning, right? Machine learning, typically the, the software stack, it's many, many libraries, all of them together can be quite, quite large. And then when you try and create a single environment that has multiple things, like you hit conflicts. So what we've done for several communities is we set it up so that you've got multiple environments sort of set up so that you can choose either environment one, environment two, environment three. Um, like that's within the Python world for sure we do that. Uh, we, we do that like R versus Python, right? Big images are more unwieldy to maintain. So a bunch of smaller ones. If it's the individual, 
Um, I, I would say that like you can ins you can do a one-off install of a package in an environment, but you still got to reboot, do it. I think that's where a repo to Docker type solution, but which is which is binder in Jupyter Hub, right? Where you're saying, well, I want to run this this ephemeral container spun up on demand. That's not at the Leap Hub today, but it's where we are trying to go. So you have that flexibility of running arbitrary environments in that in that space. Yeah. Okay. okay. Maybe we should potentially close. Oh. I'll uh, leave you maybe for the break. You can discuss together. That sounds great. Thanks so much. That was extremely in informative. And uh, I hope you use the cloud really. That's really the hope. And again, also like the potentially the carbon plan infrastructure as well, like across knowledge transfer in particular. Thanks so much everyone, for your presentation.